Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Heterodox History. Today, I'm very lucky to have Mr. D back to discuss the scouring of France. I hadn't intended when we discussed the dissolution of the monasteries for this to end up being a mini series, but it's wonderful to have you back, Mr. D, to approach another horrifyingly miserable topic. So, <laughs> lovely well, to see I, you. I... I am the perfect companion to misery, so uh, I'm very happy to be back and, and honoured uh, again uh, for you to, uh, to ask me on. Well, it's wonderful to have you on, Dee. It's uh, really a treat. In terms of an overview for this evening, obviously I've mentioned in the script, well, in the title rather, that this is mainly going to focus on the iconoclasm of the French Revolution, but I find it impossible to mention the French Revolution with not referring at least to the fact that this wasn't the first iconoclasm in France. Um, this goes back to the French wars of religion in the 16th century. If people are more interested in these topics, of course, I have lectures on both the French Revolution and the wars of religion, if you want to flesh out some of that context. Um, but the reason I bring it up is that I've been reading a very interesting book recently called The French Revolution from Calvin to the Civil Constitution by Dale K. Van Clay. And I was mainly reading it for another reason, which was trying to find out more about the monarchy's relationship with the Catholic Church and essentially why uh, the Catholic Church was no longer a confident force in French society on the eve of the French Revolution, which I attribute to so much of the revolutionary zeal especially within Paris, which um, accompanied the, uh, the advent of the French Republic. Um, however, what I find also interesting about this is reading the comparisons between the original French wars of religion and the eventual sort of uh, culmination of the revolution. And I have a little segment here from Van Clay where he's paraphrasing the argument of one Edgar Quinette, who was a contemporary of Tocqueville, and he's actually writing this from a Protestant and Whig perspective, but I find it rather interesting in terms of drawing this direct link between the two iconoclasms. Um, of course, I'll try to flesh out some context when reading this introduction. And of course, Dee, you're, you're welcome to sort of uh, interrupt me at any point if you want to um, interject. So um, here we go. The recent demise of the social interpretation of the French Revolution in Marxian form as a victory of a proto-capitalistic bourgeoisie class over a neo-feudal nobility has sent many historians scurrying back to Alexis de Tocqueville's mid-19th century classic, The Old Regime and the French Revolution. And if people are more interested in that, I believe Turnip and I very briefly uh, cover segments of de Tocqueville's work um, when we discuss the Ancien Regime which stress the pre-revolutionary state leveling effect on the social hierarchy and the continuity between royal and revolutionary administrative centralization. It has also stimulated a renewed interest in politics and high culture as agents in their own right in the coming of the revolution. Whence a quest for political and cultural continuities between the old regime and the revolution, in addition to the administrative and social ones that Tocqueville most emphasized, but post-Marxian revisionism has so far left the subject of religion more or less where it found it. Indeed, socialist historians from Louis Blanc to Abba Sabou played it more mind. Nor with the exception of Francois Fouquet has revisionism revived interest in many of Tocqueville's contemporary historians of the revolution, among them Edgar Quinet. Writing in exile after Louis Napoleon's coup d'etat, of course, Louis Napoleon is the later Napoleon III, ended the short-lived French Second Republic, Quinette, like Tocqueville, set out to answer the question why the revolution's promise of political liberty remained so largely unfulfilled at that later date. But while stressing, as Tocqueville did, the nefarious legacy of royal absolutism, Quinette put equal, if not more, emphasis on long-run religious factors, particularly the failure of the Protestant Reformation in France, from which the conception of absolutism was inseparable. Just to elucidate on what that means for people who aren't going to go away and watch the uh, lecture on the French wars of religion, from essentially throughout the entirety of the second half of the 16th century, 
there was not only a religious tumult, a, an attack on uh, material culture, attack on Catholic churches, looting, and of course this was then exported to the Netherlands and Switzerland with even more ferocity than what happened in France. French politics was polarized from Protestants on the one hand and even Catholics supported by the King of Spain on the other. And out of this religious zeal, the French monarchy under the later Bourbon dynast, starting with Henry IV, tried to steer a middle way in containing these extremes of both Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, Protestantism. The fact that so many Protestants were also aristocrats meant that humbling the aristocracy went hand in hand with pacifying France in a religious sense. And so absolutism, you could say, was the was the attempt, the antidote for this religious schism and this political turmoil during the 16th century. And nothing sort of cements that more than the fact that Cardinal Richelieu was responsible for the siege and the capture of La Rochelle, one of the great bastions of the Huguenots. And later, Louis XIV would essentially crown French absolutism with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the expulsion of the Huguenots. So anyway, back to the, um, the segment. Anything but a conservative, Quinette was among the few French liberal historians of the revolution to take a positive interest in religious phenomena, regarding them as agents of modernity as well as reaction. And although he did not inherit his mother's Protestantism, Quinette wrote a profoundly Protestant history of the French Revolution. A brief look at Quinette's La Révolution may therefore stand in lieu of a conclusion, if only by making this book's overall argument more salient by contrasting comparison. If Marx tended to regard the mode of economic production and class relations as the driving motors of historical change, Quinette came close to standing Marx on his head, regarding religion as fundamental and the economy and society as epiphenomena. Most basic to Quinette's conception of the old regime and the revolution was hence the long-term failure of the 16th century reformation in France. The French, having been unable to accept the advantages of the religious revolution of the 16th century, were eventually led to deny them. And from there, how many false views did they not end by embracing? For the survival of the confessional, the sacramental system, and a celibate and self-anointed priesthood, likewise spelt the triumph of royal absolutism, with which, in Quinette's opinion, these features of Catholicism were all too compatible. Where in Quinette's opinion, sorry, where the victory of Protestantism in England, the Netherlands and elsewhere liberated the laity from the priesthood and enshrined the principle of the free lay conscience via the doctrine of spiritual authority, a necessary prerequisite, Quinette thought, for the subsequent development of political freedom, Catholicism kept the French in thrall to a spiritual absolutism and the habits of absolute domination for another two centuries, and quite unprepared at a basic level to take full advantage of the opportunity of 1789. So conceiving this from a thoroughly sort of Whig standpoint, what I can say in sort of favour of uh, Quinette's argument is that it's certainly not materialistic. Nevertheless, he's approaching this from a fundamentally progressive point of view. That is, the Catholic Church represents some form of social prison system, the hierarchy, the veneration of a structured class of priests which determine what is true and what isn't true, as opposed to the idea of supposed Protestant nonconformity and freedom which affords modern and liberal constitutional governments. Um, just before I go on, Dee, do you have anything to say about this, uh, the general sort of tone of this argument so far? No, I'm uh, I'm 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 polling along and uh, have no have no objections or interjecting. Trying to reap the political harvest, as it were, of a philosophical century without any prior religious preparation, the French revolutionaries prematurely proclaimed the doctrine of philosophical toleration instead of first uprooting Catholicism root and branch as the 16th century Reformation had. For it was only after having disallowed Catholicism long enough to wean their populations from the habits of spiritual subservience that Protestant countries were later able to adopt a policy of confessional toleration, whereas France, having bypassed the Reformation, fruitlessly tried to institute political liberty without a prior revolution in religious consciousness. With, Catholic with Catholicism, in still other words, left in possession of the workaday lay religious conscience, 
it was only a matter of time before the revolutionaries would fail to persevere in the pursuit of a political liberty for which they were morally unprepared and to leave it to wither on the proverbial vine. So essentially, Queenette is attributing the ills of the French Revolution, the violent nature, and you can say the um, it's effectively almost like um, looking at this as a, a cauldron boiling and sort of spilling over that all of these forces have supposedly been repressed by the Catholic Church, natural forces, of course, from Queenette's point of view, pro protestant forces, which would lead to some sort of um, positive, progressive um, future for France. And of course, the fact that the original iconoclasm didn't leave lasting results. Instead, it led to a reaction in the sense of the reaction of absolutism and the reconfirmation of the Catholic Church's authority that, again, with a sort of um, a Protestant determinism, assuming that revolution in France was inevitable, the triumph of absolutism simply delayed the inevitable here and the French Revolution, the violence of the French Revolution, and indeed you can say the uh, the religious confusion, and in many ways you can say the stark, um, furious anti-Catholicism was in part the result of the failure of the first iconoclasm. I find this um, argument quite interesting in terms of trying to tie the two iconoclasms together, albeit the both you and I as, um, as Catholics, um, we're not so sort of enamored of the idea of the inevitable march of progress and us wanting the revolution to triumph, essentially. <laughs> yes, and of course it is. Um, this all sounds very familiar because it's repeated in, in, in various ways yeah, in France and elsewhere. Yeah, um, I'm very suspect of, of, the, of, this, uh, of this argument. But this is how, of course, the French Revolution, you know, I think this has become sort of standard view of the French Revolution amongst the... Yeah, you know, sort of the general populace. So, well, I think just to push back against that, I think what I find interesting about the comparison between the French wars of religion and the French Revolution is the fact that no one's really in the Anglosphere ever heard of the French wars of religion, or at least no one really knows anything about it. You might, you might say, for example, um, ha people might have a knowledge of what a Huguenot is. They might not even know as a Protestant. Um, people may have heard of the St. Bartholomew's Massacre, and as a result, they have a sort of um, innate sense of revulsion towards the Catholics. But I think beyond that, the idea of the French wars of religion forming some mm. sort of direct link with the French Revolution isn't really mentioned at all outside of very specific mm. historical circles. And even then, it's a, a rather niche talking point. Hmm, very interesting. Because, um, yeah, I, I, do, I, I do feel like do you feel like I'm quite familiar with this uh, with this argument? Perhaps I, I don't know. Um, this linking of, of, of the two things certainly, um, and of course the Huguenots. Um, you know, Britain has a you know a, a bit of that because of course some of them ended up um, in, in Britain. I think. Um, I mean, the, the etymology of Huguenot, of course, it. Uh, it's 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 basically the idea of um, comrades. There's a political as well as religious mm. fraternity which is arising in opposition to the king. And when the king is unable to safeguard the rights of the Huguenots, the Calvinists become the monarch um, the monarchomax, the ones fighting against the monarch, if not becoming republicans. And of course, that's what happens in the Netherlands. Um, what I find fascinating, of course, is that what begins in France spills over into the great iconoclastic fury in the Netherlands. And this is a preamble, effectively, to the full sethering of relations between the Northern Netherlands and the King of Spain in 1579. Um, so essentially what the French, French wars of religion have an example where we can look at essentially what could have happened had the Protestant Reformation succeeded. But beyond that, there's also um, the weird Gallican angle to consider with France, where there is a, you can say, a contradiction in terms between the monarchy also supporting Catholicism, which um, goes against Queenette's argument, which I'll read here. The chief mistake of the National Assembly's ecclesiastical legislation was hence not, in Queenette's estimation, that it thrusts its hand into the censor and dared to reform the Gallican church, but rather that it did not reform it radically enough. 
for limiting itself to externals and permitting the priesthood, even if elected to maintain the tyranny of the confessional, the civil constitution of the clergy failed to enfranchise the laity, and so to create a church significantly superior to the non-juring or refractory one. At most, therefore, this constitutional church held down crucial spiritual terrain for the counter-revolution, which in the form of the refractory clergy easily reoccupied it as soon as in 1792 the revolution began to leave the constitutional church to twist in the wind. The revolution was then obliged to fight a religious civil war within French borders against the Catholic Vendean peasants without a new gospel of its own to fight for. Hence, too, the terror of 1793-94 to was all the more terrible in being conceptually impotent and in the formal contradiction with itself, adhering as had the National Assembly to the principle of religious toleration, the Convention and the Committee of Public Safety struck all the more savagely at priests for want of a real antidote to their doctrines, and having tried to effect a political gener regeneration without a con um, concomitant uh, religious one, a concomitant, sorry, uh, the French re Revolution condemned itself to a, ter uh, a terroristic sterility, leaving it for Napoleon and his concordat to end the terror and perpetuate the sterility. Well, of course, a very Protestant argument looking at um, the preservation of a Catholic institutional, um, as opposed to the separation of church and state, as the preservation of sterility. But I, I find it rather interesting looking at this argument because looking at Gallican history, what Gallicanism essentially revolves around is the autonomy of the Catholic Church in France. The idea that the French monarch, as representing the oldest daughter of the church, should have the right to appoint his own bishops with only um, a nod from the Vatican and approval. So when you see the civil constitution of the clergy, what the civil constitution of the clergy is, um, the division between jurors and non-jurors in the French Revolution, the priests swearing an oath in fealty to the civil constitution of the clergy, and by extension, the constitutional monarchy, which then becomes the republic. So essentially, it's the argument of the two masters. Can one be both loyal to the nation and loyalty and loyal to the pope? In some ways, however, if you're looking at this within the sort of the grand historical sort of uh, narrative of France, this is almost the extremist Gallican point of view put forward. And had the wording been different, had the civil um, oath of the constitution, uh, civil uh, constitution of the clergy, been essentially for the king and not for the nation, then it would be an extreme <laughs> expression of Gallicanism, one that Louis the Fourteenth wanted to impose. So the argument weirdly here is that as a result of the Catholicism being maintained under the French absolutist system, that the reform of the, the form of the sort of religious settlement was not toleration, but a state church. It wasn't simply a matter of forming the Catholic church within France, but it was a matter of harnessing it for the French Revolution. So when it turned into this visceral anti-Catholic cult, um, you simply had the apparatus of a submissive Catholic church. And rather than exploit that, they attempted to abolish it. And of course, this was then reversed under Napoleon. Um, so this is sort of underpinning really the whole sort of nature of how something which could have earlier been an attempt to reform the Christian church ended up being anti-church in its entirety, not just anti-Catholic, but anti-Christian. And you can say that Quinette's argument here is that this is part of a delayed response that Catholicism kept Christianity in a straitjacket. And so when the anti-Christian um, point of view of Voltaire sort of went to its logical extreme, reductio ad absurdum, you end up with the, with the ferocity and the zeal, anti-Christian zeal, with the attempts of turning all of these churches into uh, bastions, into temples of reason, and then cults of the supreme being, that this is in some way the result of <laughs> French Protestantism not becoming ascendant. Um, so I think that's enough to try and draw some sort of narrative link between essentially why there could be an argument to be made between the Protestant Reformation failing and the very nature, the sort of religious nature of the French Revolution. Um, because I, I also see this in terms of the, the arguments made from within the church itself about um, this compromise between the good of the nation and the good of the church. In some ways, you can see the reformers 
conceding to this Gallican argument, which is the independence of the French Catholic Church and the subservience of the church to the state and previously to the king. Or you can see it as this uh, latent Protestantism that was suppressed. Um, I talked about this with um, the Jansenists uh, recently with Lambda, and I find all of these sort of crypto Protestant Calvinist movements that were simmering in France throughout the 17th and 18th century very interesting. And of course, the French monarchy was able to very successfully repress these, all of these movements, very successfully repress all religious factionalism and anything opposed to the interpretation of the Catholic Church, which was handed down to the French monarchy by the popes. But of course, as a consequence of that, what is essentially allowed to simmer is far more dangerous, which I find very interesting. The idea that essentially having the more fanatical elements of religion suppressed from both Jansenism on the one hand and Huguenots on the other, what instead comes about is a form of virulent anti-Christianity, um, which in some ways it manifests as theism in the form of Voltaire, and in other ways it becomes a humanist religion and the deification of man effectively. Um, so uh, unless you have any sort of a, a well, I was just, just going to make a salt, salty comment that this seems to be almost as if it's the natural consequence of Protestant Protestantism in the first place. But uh, uh, I shan't. Uh, well, well, no, I'm, I'm I'm actually inclined to agree with you. But what I find fascinating about Calvin is that. I very much situate Calvinism within the French context. I look at Calvin as the exemplar of the French Reformation. However, what's surprising about the French Reformation is even though Calvin will have a such a marked effect on the religious history of Switzerland, uh, the Netherlands, and the, indeed uh, Great Britain, um, he of course is unsuccessful in France. And so France has this sort of simmering element of uh, Calvin's legacy throughout the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th century. And you can say that the descendants of Calvin in this way sort of warp into Rousseau, and thereby this iconoclastic fury is simply a form of Calvinism, which is uh, recontextualized and manifest in some other form. Yeah, they sort of like turning elves into orcs, I suppose. <laughs> So just um, a bit of context regarding this original iconoclasm. I have um, two images up here. One is the, the looting of uh, churches in Lyon in 1562. What really spurred on the wars of religion in France was an attempt by various Protestant nobles to abduct and gain control of the king, which happened many times throughout the course of the wars of religion. Uh, the last strong Valois king, Henry II, had died in the year 1559. And throughout that point, with the exception possibly of the last Valois king, Henry III, who was murdered by a, um, a, uh, a Catholic supported by essentially the uh, wanting to avenge the murder of the Duke of Guise, the kings of France were effectively children and who controlled the king essentially and was able to counsel the king could effectively determine the religious fate of France. Well, that was the thinking among both Catholics and Huguenots during this time. Once this original conspiracy by the Huguenots in 1560 failed, it resulted in a series of impromptu iconoclasms in Rouen, in Normandy, in La Rochelle. Uh, just a, a point to bring up, D. the image on the right here is the cathedral of uh, Maillose. And this cathedral was actually in the Vendée. The ruins of this cathedral are now in the modern Vendée. So the Vendée and Western France, Southern France, was an original bastion of the Huguenots. And indeed, this region later became essentially one of the uh, Place du Sirate, one of the uh, guaranteed, hot, uh, guaranteed sort of fortress areas for the Huguenots up until the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Um, so these areas, having originally been Protestant and then become zealous bastions of Catholicism and the French wars of religion. Uh, I find it interesting how all these parallels turn on its head. And you can say that this in many ways exhibits the triumph of French absolutism and Catholicism on the one hand, but uh, this mm. results ultimately in the uh, the horrific atrocities which were committed in the War of the Vendée. Very strange, this, this reversal of fortune, so to speak. There is also one point which um, I, I want to bring up regarding how the French wars of religion really differ 
from the French Revolution in that when we see these spontaneous iconoclasms, the Catholic population at large always seems to overestimate how many Huguenots Protestants there were. At, at any point, there were only around sort of one in five French as being Huguenot Protestant, and they were vastly overrepresented in the lower nobility, which is why they proved such a threat to the French monarchy and why French absolutism was seen as the cure to that. And as a result of this, whenever there is such as, you know, the devastation in Lyon or, um, you know, attacks in Carcassonne or Tours, you have large Catholic mobs who then go after and launch reprisals against the Protestant populations. In other words, as Protestantism became more violent in its opposition to the Catholic monarchy in France and the Catholic Church in general, there were enough Catholics on the ground to forestall, you can say, what happened in the Netherlands, which was the great iconoclastic fury in which a huge swath of um, of the Netherlands was engrossed in this uh, devastation of you know, iconoclastic fury, these destruction of various churches and images. But it was the strength of French Catholicism which prevented this happening on the same on the same level in France. And indeed, as the Protestants grow to oppose the king, the French for Catholics with as much sort of zeal arise to compel the king to be more Catholic, more virulent in his opposition uh, to the Protestants. So having brought up this argument about the link between the frustrated Protestant Reformation, I think the fundamental difference here is that Catholicism was still a vital force to be contended with during the 16th century, even though it was being assailed on all sides, and even though the king was seen as essentially dithering and compromising, especially Catherine de' Medici, who was later vilified as some sort of um, anti-Catholic ogre. However, when you come to the storming of the Bastille and the revolution in 1789, the Catholic opposition is virtually muted. There is no sort of a spontaneous series of reprisals to counteract what later happens as the most violent form of iconoclasm. And when it does emerge, it emerges on a much more localized scale in the War of the Vendee, after sort of after the um, proclamation of the Republic and the execution of the king. I think that's just one interesting point uh, to consider. But before I move on, Dee, uh, is there anything you want to bring up regarding specifically the iconoclasm of the wars of religion? Um, no, I mean, we, we, we I, I think we talked about it briefly when we did the stream on scouring of, uh, of England, uh, w w of, of the sort of aftershock of, of this, you know, the French, the French wars of religion and the kind of continental, you know, repercussions around it uh, and how that affected Britain. And, 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 and so, and so differently, you know, I, I think that it's, um, it, it's worth noting that um, it, there was a fundamental a fundamentally different relationship between the Catholic Church and French people than than there was uh, between the British people and the Catholic Church for whatever reason, whether it had been you know uh, the, the slow nature at which um, this sort of severing happened in Britain. I, I don't know, but uh, I'm just always struck by uh, how how this how all of this seemed to be kind of um, you know something something that kind of spontaneously arose at once uh, but but yet also be linked in a way um i think this is almost like a like a mixture of what happened in germany with mm -hmm. the spontaneous grassroots peasants revolt and various princes defecting to the Protestant camp and then having emperor charles v trying to reimpose catholicism through military might and then of course the complete contrast to that is Henry VIII, who is dissolving the monasteries and dissipating the pilgrimage of grace. In France, however, you have a middle ground here where the king, whether it be Francis II or Charles IX and later Henry III, is trying to steer a middle ground between these two extremes of Protestantism, which is associated with the Dutch, the Swiss, and the English, and Catholicism, which is associated with Philip II of Spain. 
because there's also a foreign dimension to this. And I think France here is at its weakest in terms of its ability to project power on the international stage. Also something else to consider in terms of the unique expression of iconoclasm during the French wars of religion versus the French Revolution. Most of this conversation is going to revolve around Paris. And yet, when we look at the French wars of religion, most of the iconoclasm is outside of Paris. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Um... And indeed, Not Paris yeah, is very provincial, yeah. as most of the Protestant strongholds and later uh, fortifications were provincial. Indeed, Paris was a bastion of the Catholic League. And of course, we can't forget Henry IV's uh, uh, famous saying that uh, essentially uh, Paris was worth the mass in terms of him um, abjuring his Calvinism and adopting a tentative form of Catholicism and thus founding the Bourbon dynasty. So contrast this stalwartly Catholic Paris and then look at the radical anti-Christian Parisian mob, the, uh, the, the, the Sans-Culotte mob, the National Guard that take over. And of course that is, virul that is um, expressed with the excessive vilification of the Bastille. What I've always found fascinating about the Bastille, I mean, the English equivalent essentially would be if there was this celebration every year for the demolition of the Tower of London. I mean, and um, in every sense, I find Bastille Day utterly perplexing because it is not, it doesn't represent any of the sort of high minded values regarding the declaration of. Um, of the rights of man and citizen. Instead, it represents the inauguration of revolutionary violence and the disassemblage of property and this iconoclastic fury in France. And yet, of course, it is the staple of the French Republican government, the celebration of Bastille Day. Well, perhaps the, the truth comes out, you know, I mean, again, <laughs> I mean, that perhaps it's because of, of course, all the other things, you know, are, are just ornamentation to a fundamental celebration of revolution. And, and violence and upheaval for its own sake. I mean, that, that would be the most cynical answer, uh, I would say. Um, and I would, I'd argue, and it's almost pertinent then, uh, or, or, or sort of auspicious, in the fact that this is simply the beginning of a wave of revolutionary violence, and indeed a cult of national insurrection that is gripping France even as we speak. Um, yeah, exactly, which is ne it's never let up. I mean, since... You know, for hundreds of years, this has now become the kind of center, you know, and, and in fact, now people quite associated with the French character, oh, just French be French. Um, but also, I think in a wider sense, you know, it's it spread everywhere. You know, now, I mean, in so many kind of um, uh, of people's imagination of, uh, of, of, the, of the march of history, you know, that, that, that revolution has, has been romanticized and, and uh, in, in a way, iconoclasm itself has been kind of, you know, put into this high position, you know, as, as some sort of, re some sort of deliverance, you know, um, and, and you see that language everywhere. So it is, it is quite curious um, that, uh, that, that, you know, that, uh, you know, and, and again, I, I sort of trace all of this back, this kind of singular revolutionary aspect of the advent of Protestant, Protestantism itself. Um, well, regarding how this links up with the French rules of religion, of course, in the aftermath of the St. Bartholomew's Massacre, where Catherine de' Medici effectively resolved to eliminate the Protestant heads that were gathered in France for the marriage of uh, Henry of Navarre, this was essentially spurred on by memories of the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. The associations weren't as obvious to English speakers, but they were very obvious to the gathered mobs who were exercising that power in Paris on that day. The fear essentially was that the National Assembly had gathered at Versailles. They had been locked out during a constitutional function of royal procession. And this was simply the preamble for the king bringing in Swiss Guard to eliminate the various French revolutionary forces, like a equivalent of St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Mm. And before the Bastille became a symbol of everything which is supposed to be horrific and irredeemable about monarchy and feudalism, 
but there was a purely practical consideration in going to the Bastille, which was simply acquiring its stash of gunpowder. And of course, the governor of the Bastille, Delaunay, um, prevaricates and then decides to defend the Bastille rather than simply opening its doors to the armed assembly. And this, of course, leads to a brief altercation. The Bastille is assaulted, the, ins uh, the insurrection wins, and Delaunay is beheaded and his uh, head is paraded throughout France, uh, throughout Paris. And this is where the sort of vilification of the Bastille becomes more pertinent because it, after this purely practical consideration of gaining the gunpowder, all of a sudden the Bastille is the symbol of French absolutism. It is the symbol of this omnipresent system of oppression, even though Tocqueville makes the point very forcefully that the French monarchy under Louis XVI was becoming ever more benign, and that it is quizzical how one can look at 1789 and draw all of these uh, ridiculous um, uh, these make all these ridiculous assumptions about the French monarchy, and nothing sort of exhibits that more than they're looking for martyrs of the Bastille, effectively victims of the Bastille. There were only seven people in the Bastille at that time um, upon it being stormed, as opposed to the hundreds which the mob expected. And of course, they only found, the mob only found one prisoner who was sort of politically expedient and to parade around France and represent as some sort of national hero. And that was a uh, mad uh, Maleville, a, uh, an old man who had been sentenced there essentially for insanity <laughs> um, rather than anything else. Very dear. Uh, and um, well, you... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to resist. I re resist contemporary par parallels, but you know, people need these move, you know, any movement like this, they need to, they need to select martyr, no matter who, who, who it is. Oh, I, I think, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I think that can be left unsaid, and I think um, most of the audience will probably gather who we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so moving on from this, however, and another modern comparison you can bring up here is, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall, because the demolition of the Bastille was very carefully planned by Mirabeau and, uh, and Palloy. Um, it was carefully deconstructed over a, a course of several months from uh, 1789 until um, uh, 1790. Once the building was deconstructed, the stones of the Bastille were preserved. And Palloy even made an industry out of creating mini Bastilles from the stones of the Bastille <laughs> as little memorabilia and selling Maybe. them uh, to, uh, to overawed and grateful newly liberated uh, French citizens. In the space of the original Place de, Bast uh, Place de, la, uh, Place de la Bastille, um, there was an altar consecrated to the nation and the altar was draped with the chains found in the Bastille. And of course, you can't find a more Rousseauian <laughs> assertion of that, of a man is free, but everywhere he's in chains. Everywhere he's in chains. <laughs> in, addition, in addition to this, uh, they construct a, um, a monument before they construct the, uh, the Bastille uh, column. Uh, they construct a monument not to any Christian icon, but they construct a monument to Isis, the Egyptian goddess. Yeah. And when they find various sort of um, skeletons, obviously, uh, people who had died in the Bastille over its hundreds and hundreds of years of existence, of course, this is a medieval fortification. There is this ritualistic exhumation and then reburial of the dead prisoners as the honored sort of uh, saints of the new national revolution. <laughs> very, very odd. Uh, yeah, very odd. But again, you know, this is what this is sort of what happens. This, this is the this is the mutation, mutation after mutation. It's not stopped. It leads this sort of thing. Um, it's strange, and, and of course, that I never thought about the parallel with the Berlin Wall. Um, I mean, I, ha I have a piece of the, <laughs> a piece of the. Ber I do not have a piece of the Bastille, but I have a piece <laughs> of the Berlin Wall. But um, and and it is odd because I know I, I also have have known people from Germany who. In fact, I knew one fellow who had a really large chunk of it, and it was, you know, he just treated it weirdly, you know, in this way as a kind of, um, as a kind of holy relic of, uh, of liberation. Um, 
So it, it is very strange the parallel uh, between these two events and, and how they were in a way sort of manufactured for their, um, I don't know, propagandistic or kind of uh, sacred, this, this attempt to turn the, the secular into a sacral event. And I, I think you can't get a better example of that than, Bas than the Bastille in terms of French history as um, creating a sacred event for the revolution upon which all French history preceding it can be safely vilified and no longer yeah. considered. <laughs> Yeah. Just before I, I get on, because this obviously is, this is um, iconoclasm directed at the monarchy. This is iconoclasm directed against a system, but of course it's not deliberately anti-Christian. There's nothing specifically Christian about the Bastille. But of course there were other famous um, fortifications, monuments within Paris at the time. In the middle, I have an image or rather a painting of uh, the temple, which was later used as a prison for the royal family. And this is also where I believe um, Louis the 17th, the Dauphin, the, uh, the son of Louis the 16th, who reigned in pretense from the execution of his father up until his own death in 1795. This was actually demolished not by the Jacobin uh, Montagnard faction of the revolutionaries during the terror. This was actually demolished by Napoleon because during the Napoleonic era, of course, the royalists, by and large, never accepted Napoleon. They viewed him as the great usurper. And as this site, it basically became the opposite of the Bastille. The temple became a point of royalist pilgrimage because despite it, it effectively became the revolutionary Bastille. And it housed, of course, the, uh, the last monarch of France, effectively. And as a site of royal pilgrimage, therefore, and as a symbol of revolutionary oppression, Napoleon simply found it expedient to demolish it. Hmm. And the image I have on the right here is the Chateau of Vincennes. And you know, it's one of the most sort of uh, beautiful sort of monuments in Paris in terms of this uh, medieval legacy, which of course was also restored by uh, uh, Violette Duc, who we're going to be talking about later. But Vincennes was almost very nearly destroyed during the course of the French Revolution. In 1791, inspired by the same sort of fervor uh, which had consumed the Bastille, an armed mob of, you know, not insignificant, thousands of men um, arrived at the Chateau of Vincennes, demanding essentially that it be dismantled. And it was only the intervention of Lafayette, who was becoming increasingly disillusioned with the progression of the revolution and increasingly unpopular, it should be added, having essentially been the sword of the revolution in 1789 and 1790, who preserved Vincennes from destruction and thereby it exists today. But it was a very close run thing. Mm, yeah, indeed. Uh... So in terms of how this then proceeds, in terms of attacking royal icons, there is the infamous Women's March on Versailles, which brings the royal family back to the Tuileries Palace. In this way, you can say there isn't the destruction of Versailles, of course, but Versailles is defrocked, it is desacralized, it is no longer at the center of the royal religion. And thereafter, having been dispossessed of Versailles, the French monarchy, the French royal family, become the prisoners of the revolution. And the Tuileries Palace becomes basically an acceptable place for this new constitutional monarchy, this post-revolutionary monarchy. But it should be interesting that the Tuileries Palace now becomes the residence because that's going to form a sort of a cap off for our a cap for our discussion this evening. Um, but in some way, I do view it as a form of um, <laughs> a, a form of iconoclasm in the sense that these monuments associated with the monarchy, if not destroyed, they have to be um, um, displaced effectively. Yeah. yeah. Or, 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 or profaned in, in a way, which we, we, we can talk about when we, we talk about Notre Dame and, and other places. I mean, many of them were, um, many of certainly the um, churches, cathedrals were deliberately turned into like grain storage and such you know they were they were sort of uh, uh sort of uh pushed down into ignominious uh uses 
And obviously the most infamous example of that is uh, uh, Saint-Chapelle. Um, this, of course, is oh. the restored uh, Saint-Chapelle after uh, the, the restoration project by uh, uh, Viollet le duc um, I think this is a, a good time to move away from the fortifications in Paris and talk about the logic of dechristianization and the way that we were uh, we were talking about the rather cynical logic which underpinned the original dissolution of the monasteries. There is actually a very similar logic um, here mm. regarding the original impulse towards what would later become iconoclasm. France, of course, was bankrupt at the time of the French Revolution. There had been a major concerted effort by Necker and uh, Turgot and other controller general finances of Louis the uh, of Louis the Sixteenth to rein in French finances, and it was the situation of the fi of finances which had precipitated the calling of the Estates General with a very limited purview. And of course, once the third estate was assembled, having already been radicalized, they weren't going to accept any disillusion and were content to break off and form the National Assembly simply with members of the, National, uh, the, members of the third estate and various defectors from the first estate representing the church. And this is where de-Christianization and the, uh, the efforts to try and alleviate France's financial position go hand in hand because now that you have a, you can say effectively an anti-Christian, or at least you can say sceptical majority, which now by extension sort of running the country with the king as a puppet, you have essentially, like with Henry VIII and the monasteries acting as a source of papal power, the same logic applies to the various monasteries and churches within France. And in the same way that the monasteries were considered useless, even though they were essentially part of the industry of prayer and they represented France's connection with the spiritual from the point of view of a materialistic mindset, one that emphasizes national sovereignty over God, they of course have become surplus to requirement. So it is among the, it is actually the king and Necker and various members of the church, such as Talleyrand, and, and Mirabeau of course isn't a uh, member of the church, but he is a, uh, he is a defected, a, a, a aristocrat who defected from the second estate. It is these figures who lead the nationalization of church property. And the nationalization of the church property, of course, is to stimulate the growth of the French economy. And this is the basis for the, the assignat, the, uh, the paper currency, which would later lead to hyperinflation in the 1793. The idea that it's the projected value of the French ecclesiastical property, which is going to pay for, for anything, including the war of 1792 onwards. And this is where you can say the first iconoclasm um, ensues, because it's not simply a matter of redesignating France's uh, ecclesiastical heritage as the goods of the nation. Again, everything is recontextualized within the sense of national sovereignty, the general will, and the people, le peuple of France, representing sovereignty as opposed to the king. And the first attack on this is in the attack on silver and the government's resolution to confiscate surplus silver from various French churches. Indeed, you can say that the response from the church is so pusillanimous, expecting that they are essentially, they have been defrocked, they have been disempowered, um, that they themselves, such as the Archbishop of Paris, begins to voluntarily donate silver which isn't conducive quote unquote for proper worship to the cause of essentially restoring Fran uh, France, uh, France's financial position to be melted down and turned into coins. So at first many religious establishments in France voluntarily donate part of their um, material heritage to the government as essentially another euphemism which arise out of this, like the church is representing the good of the nation. Um, the donation of silver is referred to as patriotic gifts, effectively to demonstrate fealty to the revolution. And of course, as you can say, a cynical way of preventing reprisals on the church. So compare you compare the reprisals with, against iconoclasm in the French wars of religion, the fact that the Catholics were more than prepared to stand up and prevent their churches being sacked by Protestants in the minority. And now that it is the government 
directing these various policies. The church is essentially presenting itself as a supplicant, not wanting these measures to go any further. Um, do you have any comments on that? No, no, no nothing specific. I'm not um, terribly familiar with the, the, the that sort of economic economic aspect of it. Um, obviously, this um, this uh, sort of conversion of um, objects to 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 currency will will uh, also come in later on because it was done again done in, uh, in a way as a symbolic. The, the, uh, I would say defamation of religious objects, but no, nothing about this. But I mean, can you think of a sort of more materialistic uh, recontextualization of church property than using it simply as security for for a paper currency? Well, we, 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 <laughs> exactly, exactly, and you know, and I'm reminded again of you know historical parallels, such as moving various European um, uh, medieval objects to to Fort Knox in the U.S. during World War II and such. But you know this uh, this implication and 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 of course you know things were not only used as security for for the currency but they were often as i said uh they were profaned by uh, literally by by being melted down famously reliquaries and such um from many of these these churches were um were melted you know and 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 turned it and turned into to coinage uh, turned or turned into bullion um so yeah well i mean it, the, it, the problem with on. this d is that um the, this was essentially given over the the idea of what represents a item of proper worship was given over to secular officials and of course mm. this idea of proper worship was incredibly subjective so instead uh government officials were simply ordered to collect inventory of all essentially of what was considered you know surplus to requirement within these churches which invariably meant essentially anything of anything. value yeah. and in the place of these objects um revolutionary seals were left in the vacated spaces as if to oh. indicate that it is now the nation and the revolution that has imposed its supremacy via these new revolutionary icons on the church itself and of course yeah. The French Revolution is wonderful for its euphemisms, such as the goods of the nation and patriotic gifts. Uh, the organization which was responsible for the melting down of silver was, of course, called the Committee for the Alienation of National Goods. And <laughs> so having assembled this, you know, grand horde um, in Paris, regardless, irrespective of any religious or aesthetic value, um, all of these relics were thrown into the furnace in Paris and uh, minted into coins. And once the damage essentially had been noted by figures who had been in part responsible for this to begin with, such as Talleyrand, um, the revolutionary uh, government reluctantly uh, conceded to the creation of a committee of monuments, which was established to preserve certain quote unquote masterpieces at the height of this loot. And it should be noted that when this originally began to happen, of course, there was Catholic acquiescence in part, believing that the revolutionaries to some extent had a point that they are, Catholic churches are over adorned. So we might as well donate some property to this uh, new sort of uh, revolutionary government. But of course, um, this would also coincided with some sort of uh, Catholic polemics and theological justification for this. In fact, this is sort of bears modern consideration whether the church should exist as a charitable organization, essentially a church for the a church for the facilitation of good works, or whether it is a church in sort of revolutionary language, which is responsible for the hoarding of things and things only. Um, but of course, as the revolution progresses, these Catholic polemics become less significant and effectively the Catholic pleas fall on deaf ears. And it is now the sort of secular antiquarians who are justifying the preservation of these quote unquote things. And they're not preserving them as religious artifacts, they are preserving them as relics of the nation. So even the defense of these objects now is recontextualized to service the ends of the French Revolution. In, indeed. And, and this is, a, of course, a problem that persists. I mean, I, I think a question that persists, that persists the present day, you know, to, I mean, to, to what degree when you go to, to an art museum, 
you know, when you're wandering past the, the spoils of centuries, you know, I mean, so much of it had a, a sort of um, a, a sacred or a, um, a ritualistic connotation, you know, which of course is now all gone and it's all just, again, it's, it's stuff. It's good stuff. It's masterpieces, as you say, you know, uh, again, the, the preservation of, of, of monuments, but they're monuments to the craftsmen, they're monuments to the state, they're monuments to the, the people rather than to to God or to, you know, any sort of um, sense of, of sanctity that they once were. So it, it, it is curious how the people who, in, in many cases, say, and to this day, the people who protect and, and save and rescue some of these things are uh, are doing so for the logic that came by from the very forces who broke that chain and destroyed all of these things in the first place. So, so uh, it, it is something certainly to bear uh, consideration. And again, uh, I'm sure you can invite modern comparisons to this also, but when the official channels, the government wasn't seen as ferocious enough in terms of the desacralization of these churches. Um, we now have this devolving to the quote unquote grassroots street level where churches are simply broken into, uh, mobs take the silverware yeah. and they desecrate the hosts. And in many places, this wasn't even done for purely financial reasons often people just, uh, say for example, in the case of uh, uh, the monastery of uh, St. Roche, um, there was a raid on St. Roche in the uh, summer of 1790. And later the monstrances and the various relics were simply found um, in a pile of filth. Essentially the object had been intentionally sacrilegious rather than monetary. Yeah. And as a result of this, once these items were restored, uh, the clergy had various ceremonies of purification held because this was an intentional act of sacrilege. And of course the attack on the church continues. Um, the tithes are abolished, thereby taking away the church's independent source of funding. Now that um, we have the sort of creation of the assignat, we have the declaration of the civil law for the clergy. And of course, I've already mentioned that there is an aspect of Gallicanism which permeates this, the idea that, yes, the church in France should be independent from the Pope and it can still remain a Catholic, uh, a Catholic church. But of course, this sort of exposes the deep divisions um, within France and the Catholic Church and how a divided church where there are so many, um, you know, either high-ranking officials like Talleyrand, who was the uh, Bishop of Autun, um, and of course, local parish priests who are going along and making these declarations in fidelity to the revolution, that as a result of this, the Catholic Church can't act as effective um, uh, protector of its own property, let alone the, the theological principles of uh, Catholic Christianity. So the king here reluctantly intervenes um, to try and protect Catholics using his now constitutionally bestowed veto powers. And all this does is accelerate the essentially the path towards his own execution and the fanaticism of the French Revolution. Now that this has been, these forces have been unleashed, uh, they can't be contained any longer. Indeed. Yeah, yes. And of course, this this is a very common theme in history, you know. Uh, I mean, man in a state of nature, you know, you know, is 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 nothing more than a beast. And of course, the, you know, the, the 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 average man on the ground, people who, as you say, were profaning things for the sake of profaning them, breaking things for the sake of breaking them. I mean, this is this is what happens when, you know, there's a dissolution of the hierarchy that holds the civilization together. You know? You know, this is this is what man will always revert to. Um, so, uh, you know, and and of course, again, sometimes you know these force th this fact of humanity is used by people who want to achieve political ends, and then of course they realize it's it's a fire that spreads far more far more rapidly than they can imagine, and uh, and it gets out of hand. And of course, you you as you, you mentioned. Lafayette and other other figures, you know, who very quickly realized what what the French Revolution 
what they had unleashed and, and they were powerless to stop it and eventually it would consume them, you know, and, and any concession made to this, uh, you know, it's, it's dipping your dipping your sleeve into the fire and, and you're, you may be consumed as well. So, yeah. Well, I mean, just to buttress your point, one of the great turning points in the early course of the French Revolution is the quote unquote massacre on the uh, the Champ de Mar, the field of Mars. After the king makes his flight to Varennes and is brought back, figures who had been instrumental in the French Revolution, such as Belly, um, who stands, it should be mentioned, in that famous portrait of the oaf for the maintenance of the National Assembly in the Versailles Tennis Court and then becomes the mayor of Paris, he is responsible for putting down the more radical French revolutionaries who are now wanting the deposition of the king in concert with Lafayette. And of course, Lafayette, upon the declaration of the Republic in 1792 and the storming of the Tuileries Palace, um, of course, defects from the French government. He will have nothing to do with it. He is for a constitutional settlement more in line with, say, for example, America than the national convention and swearing all power to this uh, revolutionary um, Rousseauian body. So yes, absolutely, in terms of looking at this and the acceleration of the process of the revolution. I have um, a couple of segments here on the methods and the manifestations of iconoclasm in the course of the revolution. The citation um, is linked in the description. But just to give a bit of context of how we get to 1793, and again, trying to contextualize this within the idea of iconoclasm directed against the monarchy and not just the church. As you know, just before I get there, there's an interesting point which someone left in the chat, if I can find it. Um, many faithless priests tried preserving their lifestyles. Uh, the, well, it's not that simple. And this is why I go back to the argument of Queenette, which I brought up at the beginning, and why I struggled previously to try and understand why Catholicism was so pusillanimous in the face of the French Revolution, because it had been so successful in driving opposition underground. And the argument by Queenette and more sort of nuance from Van Clay, I'm going to try and find an a justification for going into this book in detail, but again, I'll be more focused on the royal religion versus the Catholic Church in France. But the argument essentially is that expressions of genuine opposition within the church were driven underground. And so when the church was exposed to a force from without, in the case of the secularizing French religion, all it did was expose the fact that many subversives have simply buried their heads and had accepted the uniformity within the Catholic Church. But all of a sudden, when the position of the Catholic Church is under threat, all of these voices of dissent, which had been essentially um, hidden before, were now out in the open. And nothing exposes that more than the division between the jurors and the non-jurors. You can't sort of look at this and all attribute this to wanting to preserve their own lifestyles. I think this represents a crisis of the Catholic Church and indeed the legacy of Gallicanism within France as well, in terms of trying to add a bit more nuance to this discussion as to why the Catholic Church was so weak in the face of this threat and how it degenerated into this de-Christian campaign. Do you think that's fair? I think that's I think that's certainly fair. So this starts off with 1793. So we have the flight to of uh, the flight to Varennes. We have the mass the quote unquote massacre of Champ de Mar. We have the declaration of war on Austria, which essentially is meant to capture the king from his relatives and for the revolution. Nevertheless, the king becomes more disillusioned with the progress of the revolution and becomes more alienated from the government. Radicals precipitate the storming of the Tuileries Palace, his residence. We have the last stand of the Swiss Guard who are massacred. And again, it's, it's not enough to remove the king from Versailles. Now we have the royal palace itself being stormed. If you, I'm sure people are aware of the, uh, the Sergei Eisenstein um, film showing the storming of the Winter Palace. 
this is a real storming. It's, this isn't a propaganda storming like we had the storming of the Winter Palace. The only victim of the storming of the Winter Palace in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, uh, was the royal wine cellar. <laughs> oh, sorry, the imperial wine cellar. Whereas the storming of the Tuileries Palace... Not, not was... to be discounted as a tragedy. <laughs> You have a lot of um, drunk uh, Bolsheviks and uh, members of the Preobrazhensky regiment wandering around at night in uh, Petrograd. Um, but this was a massacre, and it was almost a massacre of apocalyptic proportions. Essentially, the monarchy had been violently and directly assailed. The residents of the king had been stormed. And this wasn't the first time either. There were many other instances between 1789 and 1792 of mobs breaking into the Turi Palace and the National Guard being completely impotent in the face of the mob. So regularly this happened. And when we see the Turi Palace being sacked in the autumn of 1792, this is simply a severe escalation of these attacks on not, not just the buildings associated with the monarchy, but on the person of the monarch himself. And of course, he is sentenced by the National Convention. He is executed at the beginning of the seven, uh, 1793, uh, heralding the creation of the French Republic. And it's within this context that um, this segment on the campaign against symbols and the campaign against Notre Dame is written. Throughout the early months of 1793, the sections of Paris were divided within, uh, within and among themselves. So one of the things that divided the early French revolutionaries so much was how to deal with the king. Essentially, this is where the Montagnard faction and the Girondin faction, you can almost say that the French revolutionary equivalents of the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, albeit that is vastly oversimplified, but just as a way, as, as a way of a flawed analogy. The idea is essentially, does the king deserve to die or should the king live? Should we embrace a more sort of an aspect of humanitarianism and reconciliation uh, or does the creation of the Republic necessitate the death of the king, as is the argument advocated by Saint-Just, uh, Saint uh, Saint which later becomes, he effectively becomes the angel of death for the Montagnard uh, revolutionary faction. Yeah, I was going to say, guess how that question turned out. So the argument wins out that the birth of the Republic uh, necessitates the death of the king, and the lingering divisions over this argument create this sectionalism within France and indeed the creation of left and right, which is why I always try and disassociate myself from the appellation of the right, because oh. it always comes out of a directly revolutionary context. It has now been established that the revolution is a fait accompli. So it is simply a matter of are you with the Girondins, are all the federalists, those looking to America, or are you for the Montagnards, the Jacobins, who are focused on the full implementation of a Rousseauian agenda and, and coincidingly still... support regicide. And we are still trapped in this cage over 200 years, 200 years on. Uh, uh, unbelievable. No, uh, again, the, the, the left and right. A lot, a lot of people surprisingly don't know that uh, the origin of this, but again, it is being sort of trapped in the dialectic of you know, in a, in a revolutionary dialectic, still. The only way to sort of free yourself out of that is, again, to use terms which are applied to those who do not accept the left-right dichotomy, which is reactionary or counter-revolutionary. Mm. But even those are terms being bestowed by the revolutionary factions. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. So the Republicans are now divided into sections as to what path the revolution should take. Um, so reading again from this section, as the interior minister Roland had argued in his report the previous October, radical sectionists were exerting increasing influence and moderates were not attending assemblies in sufficient numbers to provide a counterbalance to increasing radicalism. Where moderates were active in the assemblies, local radicals organized delegations to visit neighboring sections that they considered more like-minded or threatened by moderates. In effect, an intersectional network was being formed that rivaled the municip municipality government of Paris. Effectively, what we see throughout the course, indeed, this has been happening through 1792, is these spontaneous acts of 
not just revolutionary violence, but you can say insurrection um, that has been directed against the official channels of government. Um, and this is why the left in the course of the French Revolution, and I do mean left in the direct sense as representing the Montagnard or the, the mountain, faction um, is always able to accelerate the cause of the French Revolution because they are prepared to use any means. They are the ones actually organizing on the ground, whilst the Girondins are the ones adhering to the principles of constitutional government, and as such, they are outmaneuvered every single time. The police commissioner, Dutard, in a report to the Interior Ministry, uh, Minister Gaha, described the phenomenon as a species of federalism established between the various factions. For example, on the 21st of April, the Section de Lombard sent a delegation to the Section de Contas Social that was um, meeting in St. Eustace. And again, it's all of these sections are meeting in the now disused and confiscated monasteries of France. And they are finding themselves essentially these increasingly zealous Republicans who are overrepresenting the Montagnard faction as opposed to the moderate factions are now finding themselves in these monuments which have been dedicated to the monarchy and to the Catholic Church. And they were now committing themselves to the destruction of a aristocratic hydra, which is supposed to represent the enemies of the revolution, or as we mentioned, the, the idea of the, the eternal counter-revolutionary. Mm. So it is within this context that the destruction of various symbols actually becomes a political necessity for various sections within the revolution uh, to emphasize their dedication to the revolution. So just yeah. continuing this. Um, and I, I, the, just, I just yeah. will invite people again to think about how this provided framework, so many things, things that we experienced uh, today in our, in our own in our own world. So carry on for it. Uh, but again, there's also an incentive for moderates to do this as well. It's not just radicals finding mm. themselves within these uh, these bastions of you know counter-revolutionary symbolism, but moderates are now having to destroy these various symbols to essentially prevent the accusation of there being moralist sympathizers as well. Yeah. So again, the the religious ferocity, uh, the, the the iconoclastic fervor has a logic within itself which necessitates a ever sort of a inexorable lurch towards the left. Yep. In theory, signs of feudalism had been prescribed for years, as had signs of royalism since August of 1792, which of course is the month of the revolution. And of course, just to emphasize how far these anti sort of uh, pre-1792 um, allusions go, 1792 becomes the year one in the revolutionary calendar. Eventually, the 12 months and the seven day week will be abolished and replaced with the decade, the 10 day week. And of course, what is this directed at? It is directed against the worship on Sunday. Um, if you remove Sunday, then of course, you add to the redundancy of all these confiscated parish churches. Already, um, the venues for dice, uh, for Diocesan uh, worship had been prescribed by the uh, constitutional government. And now they are even taking away the limited places where worship is allowed. And um, in addition to that, all symbols of, again, quote unquote, feudalism. Uh, again, you can see how much Marxian analysis is so much indebted to the course of the French Revolution and the model of which is then uh, essentially the prescription for all revolutionary movements all across the world because of the language which has been utilized here and directed against the monarchy in France. Yes. And also, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, just as a side note, this is why the metric system is evil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, they went so far as to, to try to propose a revolutionary clock. I don't know that, that there are, they're very rare, but there are existing um, specimens, which is, which was to try to make a metric clock i believe uh it, it, totally unworkable but well i mean they'd already had metric calendar so why not a metric clock yeah um yeah. there's a it's, it's the same logic and of course um because there are 365 days in the year um the maths didn't make sense no. and of course the months are supposed to coincide with um the rotation of the moon but of course um they were out of sync as well so you have 
30 day months, you have 10 day weeks. And of course, you then have five dates for celebration at the beginning of the year. And of course, um, the beginning of the year is removed from, you know, the 1st of January, and instead it's to coincide with the spring equinox. Uh, just a, this comment, which is coming up, apparently atheism was rampant in pre-revolutionary France. That's what I heard. Uh, I wouldn't say atheism was rampant. I would say anti-Catholicism was rampant. Mm -hmm. And Voltaire made this very popular. And of course, when you look at uh, the authors of the uh, encyclopedia, such as Diderot, um, they were all more or less uh, operating on a trajectory, even like a historiographical trajectory, because this is really the origin of history as a sort of a, a discipline within itself. Uh, they're all operating on a trajectory which is anti-Catholic, anti the sort of veneration of symbols and the history of France at this time, other than, as we mentioned before, rededicating these as relics of the nation, as opposed to relics of monarchy or relics of a Catholicism. And indeed, you can say atheism itself is actually officially prescribed by Robespierre, uh, when you have the cult of the supreme being. Indeed, he regards atheism as a elite practice, as an aristocratic practice, and that in order to represent the general will um, properly, in order for France to have a genuinely sort of popular revolution, there has to be a godhead. It's not enough for atheism simply to preside over all of this. So, um, And of course, Voltaire wasn't an atheist, he was a theist. However, the reality of removing mass symbols inside and outside of all the churches in Paris was a huge and labor-intensive project. Regarding the work of the, um, the administration of public works, there was a focus on suppressing feudal and royal signs on religious buildings that no longer had a Catholic function. And of course, the buildings that no longer have Catholic functions increase exponentially during the course of the revolution, especially in Paris. Efforts were also being made to remove rural signs from public squares and secular buildings, for example, the homes of nobles, many of whom have now fled their residence in Paris, and if not have gone to the countryside, they have fled the country and become émigré. An ambiguous order from the Administration of Public Works dated the 7th of December 1792 was holding up this process. Again, this was um, regarding what was explicitly a royalist symbol. Was it the official coat of arms of the French monarchy or the fleur de lis more generally? Nevertheless, sections were reporting the number and location of various pres prescribed signs in the locales to the Paris Commune in order that action might be taken against them. Notre Dame seems to have been the focus of a concerted effort of de-signification slightly earlier in other spaces that had dual religious and secular functions. And again, this is the association which Quinette um, brings up together, which is especially for the French Revolution progressive factions, that the monarchy and the Catholic Church represent some sort of um, uh, unholy dyad. Perhaps this was because the cathedral was the most prestigious church in the capital city. By carrying out the suppression of feudal and royal signs in that particular space, the authorities could signal that action was being taken and would soon be taken elsewhere. So Notre Dame was effectively a symbolic act of state-imposed sacrilege, which was supposed to <laughs> be the, the symbol across the entirety of France that this was going to take place elsewhere. And again, I can't help but feel that uh, recent events again have uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. given a similar impression. Yeah. Again, using the uh, Notre Dame again as that symbol. Again, uh, the vestigial symbol of all these. Um, but also notice in this image on the left, which is one of the few photographs we have of the actual devastation being done to Notre Dame, of course, with the, uh, the statuettes on the doors have been uh, destroyed and the spire is no longer there. Somewhat eerily similar. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, we'll. I, I suppose we'll get to it um, with um, later events, but the spire, um, the medieval spire, had had, had by this time been uh, been taken down. Uh, well, it, I believe that it actually it actually sort of partially fell over because I mean it had been there for hundreds of years and it was structurally unstable at that point. But uh, yeah, uh, it's quite quite eerie to see uh, uh, to see it w without as, as it remains uh, now today. Since the end of 1792, local sectional assemblies have been putting pressure on the Paris Commune to get on with removing offensive symbols in the space. 
At least one reported iconoclastic attack had occurred as a result of the slow response of the authorities. Again, looking back at the example of uh, the monastery of uh, Saint Roche, which is the idea that there was sufficient popular antagonism towards the Catholic Church on the ground, or at least that was being fermented by the various sections themselves, the um, the Jacobin clubs, um, that effectively they believe the government wasn't hastening this process fast enough. And of course, this also works as an indictment on the government, because as a result of this, the government is basically carried along by the revolutionary impetus on the ground to become more radical as a result of this, especially throughout the year 1793. Various goods were taken down, sealed in plaster to protect them, and then driven to deep uh, uh, depots um, at the Petit Augustin in two carriages. Various, this job was completed by the 27th of May 1793. Early in June, another set of marble and bronze inscriptions were taken from one of the chapels, moved by hand onto nine carriages and transported to the depot. Although this work was carried out earlier than similar efforts in other churches, in reality it dealt with only a fraction of the various inscriptions, paintings and sculptures in Notre Dame that bore prescribed signs and under the law had to be, removed, had to be moved, altered or destroyed. There are two explanations for this. The work was being undertaken, again I'll actually move beyond this, but um, there is an impetus here, which is now it has been prescribed by law that these various things need to be destroyed. And you can say, like the dissolution of the monasteries, this is because it's taking place under a national emergency, i.e. we need to confiscate loot, we need to loot the churches in order to pay for our war against Austria and by extension most of Europe, but also any sort of existing symbols of the revolution could essentially become ways of inspiring popular resistance against the revolutionary government at a time where the nation is under arms and soon Carnot will bring about the levy en masse to bring about the national mobilization, not just of the resources, the, the goods of the nation, so to speak, but of the entire populace to commit itself to the preservation of the revolutionary republic. Sorry, I, I, do you have any sort of comment on, on that? <laughs> Sorry about that. No, um, no, no, no comment. From the 29th of May to the 2nd of June, 1793, radical sectionaries mobilized in Paris and forced the expulsion of the moderate Girondins who had dominated the legislature and had, had equivocated on the issue of the regicide. So again, even though the... Girondins have achieved power through legal means within the context of the new revolutionary government. It is the momentum on the ground within Paris that precipitates political action, which favors the left in the case of the Montagnards, who take power in June of 1793 and then accelerate the persecutions, not just of um, accelerate the course of iconoclasm, uh, but also accelerates the cause of the guillotine of various executions. And this is where we have the advent of the terror. It was only after this coup that the legislature, i.e. the National Convention, pressed for the acceleration of the suppression of signs of feudalism and royalty. On the 4th of July, a decree was passed by the convention that charged the municipality of Paris with the creation of a special committee of four members of the Committee of Monuments and six delegates to the Commune of Arts to remove attributes of royalty from all civil or religious public monuments. Action was originally slow, and by the year of the uh, by the beginning of the year two, the Minister of the Interior reported to the departments that the Committee of Public Safety and the Convention were receiving complaints on a daily basis about the survival of marks of feudalism and royalty. And again, I, I can't help but look at this and see that there is um, popular movement supposedly on the ground, which is calling again for the government always to be more radical in its iconoclasm, that these symbols have now become offensive to the sense <laughs> to the sensibilities of the revolutionary mass and that the government needs to take action to remove these offensive symbols um, before again I, I can't help but continue bring associations <laughs> with um with with modernity here but of course yeah. this is a <laughs> Well, this is there is, any... you know, this, this yeah. evil spirit uh, unleashed upon the world has never left us. So, yeah, yes, obviously, we, we're playing this out <laughs> over and over and over again. Uh, you know, and, and yes, I mean, this idea that these symbols have become so odious that they're, they're like, you know, um, excuse the 
a cursed pop cultural uh, reference, but like kryptonite, you know, they they're 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 repellent and they must be removed. You know, they're 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 sapping the revolutionary spirit. So uh, yeah, it's it's very odd. It's very odd how this uh, how this so called logic remains. The municipality of Paris used the political and material value of these represent representational objects, such as that in the Monastery of St. Eustace, to signify the authority's hatred of feudalism and royalism, as well as a determination to mobilize the resources available for the city's war effort, i.e. metal objects which hadn't already been melted down. On the 29th of July, the administration of public works had given the order for increased action to be taken in suppressing all signs of feudalism and royalty throughout Paris. Two days earlier, Minister de Jean had been instructed to begin suppressing signs in the monastery of saint Roch, where the section uh, de la Botte de Moulin met. But other spaces, such as the monastery of saint sulpice where the section de Luxembourg sat, were left unaffected until the start of the program of de-Christianization. Perhaps this inaction can be explained by the fact that the meeting in Sassoulpice tended to be peaceful. Nobody accused the section de Luxembourg of royalism or having aristocratic sympathies, and as such, it was less urgent to remove signs that could provoke such accusations. But nevertheless, all, all these organizations would later be accused as having lacking in some way some form of revolutionary fervor, thus accelerating the impetus that all such symbols would need to be plastered over or removed or hacked at in order to essentially purify France and remove it from the stain of these feudalistic and um, uh, Catholic affectations. And now I'm coming to the specific effects of the uh, destruction of uh, Notre Dame. Despite the suppression of signs during the summer of 1793, the gallery of kings above the main entrance of Notre Dame remained in place, a small consolation to royalists. The sculpture's presence aggravated radicals who wished to see them destroyed. Charmette, a member of the commune, announced his anger at the situation in an article called The Signs of Royalty to a Face. In the, again, again that's a, a wonderful <laughs> article title, isn't it? It's very direct. <laughs> yeah, that leaves no ambiguity. In The Revolutions of Paris, published in July 1793, he wrote, soon a Republican will be able to walk through the streets of Paris without running the risk of wounding his eyes with the sight of all these emblems and demeaning attributes of royalty that were sculpted or painted on nearly all public buildings and private houses, wounding of eyes. We must work tirelessly to make these repulsive images disappear, Gothic monuments to the servitude of our fathers. Without Liber doubt, liber liber liberation, liberation from, from all oppression, from all signs of oppression. Without doubt, he added, we must not forget to decapitate more or less all of the kings of stone that overlay, overload the portal of the metropolitan church. By labeling the sculptures as Gothic in a pejorative context and saying that they overloaded the portal, it seems that Charmette was anticipating the possibility of them being defended on ascetic grounds as they had been by the Committee of Monuments at the end of 1792. Again, the idea that even though the Committee of Monuments has been set up to try and protect so-called masterpieces, that the Committee of Monuments, of course, will not be strong enough or powerful enough to prevent the desecration of what is essentially undoubtedly the masterpiece of Notre Dame Cathedral. In an invoice for the work he had carried out in September 1973, Cellier noted that he had chiseled an inscription into the paving of Notre Dame's sanctuary that also sought to anticipate any counter-potential connoisseurial concern. It said, under the reign of the law, liberty has made disappear that which wounded the eyes of Republicans and has conserved this paving out of respect for the arts. Like Charmette, Cellier was asserting that action against politically unacceptable signs did not entail disrespect for the arts. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, there you go. You know, the, the arts becomes this, this sort of sanitized, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, what would, what would be the best thing, you know, um, a bug in amber, you know, uh, uh, an animal in a jar of formaldehyde, you know, that it, that it, it remains purely for aesthetic reasons, purely for, you know, service to uh, the spirit of the, of the state. And that, yeah, of course, that's, uh, that, and, and that is now the moment we, we, are, we, are, we still find ourselves. 
ridiculous. It was only in early September of 1793 when the section de la Cité wrote a letter to the Commune saying that it wanted the signs of royalty and feudalism around and outside of Notre Dame to be suppressed, that action was finally taken. It's entirely possible that the section was responding to news that Toulon had fallen to the Royalist British Army and the Convention's subsequent ruling on the 2nd of September that terror was the order of the day. So as the military situation in France worsens, the acceleration, iconoclasm effectively accelerates. And again, the idea to enunciate what Robespierre said, um, the idea of virtue and terror, um, virtue without terror is effectively impotence. And in order to purify the Republic and prevent any sort of uh, royalist pilgrimages, then all of these images need to go. Minister Dergeon was authorized to employ the entrepreneur of buildings, Bazin, to go ahead with the work around Notre Dame. He began on the 10th of September and finished on the 4th of October. With the help of two masons and an A, Bazin erected a 50 foot high scaffold so that his work at the front of the cathedral could be carried out. They then suppressed the signs of royalty on the figures of the kings, leaving the bulk of the sculpture in place. Even after Bazin had made his alterations to the Gallery of the Kings, it would seem that demands for their total destruction continued. On the 23rd of October, 1793, the Commune ruled that within eight days, the Gothic simu um, simulacra of the kings of France, which are placed at the door of Notre Dame, will be brought down and destroyed. They said measures had to be taken against all monuments that recall the memory of kings, once again, the sculptures were described as Gothic, adding the label of simulacra, suggested that they were mere, mere likenesses that had no other merit as art. As master mason and entrepreneur of Paris, Varane was charged with the removing of the statues. In his invoice to the Administration of Public Works, he wrote, from the gallery, one called at the kings at the height of the first order of the door. I removed 28 figures of hard stone, each 10 feet high. Varane added, that the figures were mutilated to ease their removal before they were thrown onto the pavis. Once the statues were down, the pavement had to be mended because of the impact that had been caused by the damage of the collapsing statues. Care had to be taken to avoid causing similar damage to a little shop occupied by a wig maker just under the adjacent door. The statues were then piled on the pavis where they remained as signs of the downfall of the monarchy. It was not until March 1796 that the municipal architect Poyer finally ordered that they be removed. It seems that when uh, it seems that a well-known royalist, Jean Baptiste Lacanard, managed to acquire the statues from an entrepreneur charged with their removal. Certainly, it was during building work in 1977 in the basement of a house that had been built for Lacanal in 1796 on the Rue Chasseau d'Antan that 21 of the 28 heads of the kings were found, along with 343 other fragments of sculpture, also wrapped in plaster for protection. It would seem that Lacanal knew the sculptures were not going to get past the triage to enter one of the Republic museums, so he put his own private preservationist project into effect. As a royalist, he was probably relieved simply to see the statues removed from a public square where they had long been available as targets for Republicans. If Louis Sebastien Mercier is to be believed, before their removal from the Pavis, the debris had been used as a public convenience by some Parisians, defecating on the statues clearly signified the contempt for their subjects. There we go. There had been an official plan proposed by the painter and member of the convention, Jacques-Louis David, for dealing with the remaining fragments of the Statue of Kings. And again, this is something you're going to bring up later with um, Manet and the role of um, incredibly famous artists such as David um, in terms of their, their role in accelerate, their, essentially their political profile as well as their artistic profile. <clears throat> Just out of yeah. curios out of curiosity Ooh. before um what what are your thoughts on David, both as an artist and as a political agitator? I don't I haven't delved uh so much into his um his, his political activities. Um as an artist, I you know, again I am I'm I am fairly cold on neoclassicism um a, a, as a rule. It depends upon you know where and when and which exp exponents. Uh, I do think that uh, obviously he cannot be discounted as an important figure, but um, there is a just just from an artist's perspective, there is a um, there is a certain road coldness to his work that I, I find uh, slightly off-putting. 
Um, oddly enough, of course, that uh, I believe that uh, Violette Leduc's um, uncle uh, was a a student of David, so there's a there was a real relationship there. But uh, yeah, a difficult um, a, a, di a, di a difficult figure given my uh, my my sort of. Um, uh, as someone's already mentioned in the chat, uh, David was essential, essentially, as um, the icon creator for aspects of the revolution. So he was responsible for the I death mean, of Marat. <laughs> <God. Yeah. laughs> an, an unbelievable, that picture. But, yeah. uh, but not only uh, the, the death, or rather the martyrdom of Marat, but he was also responsible for the... Um, uh, coronation painting of Napoleon as well. Of Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, you 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 had to. See, anyway, it's it's like this idea that uh, AA and I AA and I have discussed that you know there were certain there are certain figures who could just change the flag on their desk and remain employed uh, as all of this chaos and transition occurs around them. So, and certainly with artists, there's a certain mercenary. Um, entrepreneurial spirit that you know can can change with the times if need be so, and of course the... you know he, david is also painting um you know desk socrates and the oath of Horatia, and all, all of those other pictures as well so uh which, which, which had a, certainly had political connotations I, I would say i mean the oath of Horatia was essentially a um embodiment of that uh, new neoclassical spirit and veneration for the Roman Republic, which underpins so much. I mean, this is what we need to understand about Rousseauianism, is that it's not just projecting this sort of idealized past, but there is a specific antiquarianism uh, regarding Rousseauian um, thought, which mm. is fundamentally pre-Christian. It is the veneration of the Roman, by extension, the pagan republic, and indeed uh, the Athenian model of uh, original democratic governance. But all of this, again, is directed against feudalism, is directed against medievalism, and by extension, what comes out of it, which is the French monarchy. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh... In November 1793, David proposed the construction of a huge allegorical statue of Le Pop to stand on top of the debris of the Statue of Kings on the Pont Neuf, wherein Henry IV's equestrian sculpture had originally stood. David's own entry won a competition held for the design of the monument. In his address to the National Convention, which passed a decree supporting the project, David praised both the iconoclastic action of the commune against the Gallery of Kings and the laws of the convention that supported it. Thus, this iconoclastic statue raised to the sovereign people could be erected in thanks to both sets of authority. The monument was being used as a means of consensus building, a point that David emphasized when he said the statue, by its fusion, will be a symbol of unity, i.e. a unity once we've removed all aspects of dissent. Like other revolutionaries, David undermined the ascetic value of the statue of kings used as the base, referring to them as Gothic effigies. He also calls the proposed statue a monument, but said that it was to be built on the debris of idols of ignorance and superstition. Thus he attacked the way <laughs> in which he imagined idolaters had used the sculptures of kings and furthermore he said that it was the terrible revolutionary judgment of posterity that decided the sculptures were no histor of no historical value except as signs that signified the defeat of tyranny by the people. The new sculpture was to be given a monumental form and legitim a legitimization to the increasingly common iconoclastic ways of imagining and constructing the revolution. It also gave physical form to the claim that the, revolutionary, uh, the revolution destroyed art, but that liberty inspired French artists to replace the lost pieces with more enlightened images. But as with so many of the monuments, um, um, monumental projects of the revolution, a change in regime occurred before this statue was built. Uh, so what do you think about this idea that it's fine to destroy the artworks of a previous regime so long as you replace them? I don't I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I mean, I, I suppose there's a certain logic in it. And of course, it's something that we see uh, throughout history. Um, 
even even into ancient times, of course. Uh, Demnatio, the Morii, and uh, even the Egyptians did it, uh, obviously, with uh, you know, with famously with the art that came out of the age of Akhenaten. But um, you know, again, I, I am I am of a uh, of conservative preservationist bent. I, I don't like to see beauty erased from well. So, uh, but uh, you, you know, and it's a bit very dangerous path for artists to take. You know. Once you sign on to a certain program of iconoclasm, especially when backed up by a particular political or, you know, um, power, uh, when things turn, you know, they're probably maybe turn on you <laughs> as well uh, if you're if you're an artist. So um, I, I don't know. It's just madness. For so moving on from Notre Dame, I'm just going to focus on some other high-profile aspects of iconoclasm. So this obviously is a, an image of the restored Saint-Chapelle and the two images on the right. But obviously Saint-Chapelle was uh, created under the reign of um, Louis IX, Saint-Louis, uh, who was also responsible for much of the work on Notre Dame de Paris as well. Um, it was essentially a royal reliquary. I mean, Louis the Ninth, uh, in addition to being a crusading king, was very much responsible for acquiring these uh, holy artifacts. I mean, after the um, Fourth Crusade, which sacked Constantinople, um, Catholic Christendom all of a sudden found themselves in possession of, um, say, for example, um, the crown of thorns supposedly which was held supposedly again in constantinople and louis the ninth went to great efforts to acquire these various holy items at, at the height you can say of the uh of the religious sort of adoration for the crusades and um the return and the height of pilgrimages as well saint chapelle was thus conceived as a uh, essentially a um a sanctuary for all of these um, holier sort of uh, relics associated with Christendom. And it's for that reason that Saint-Chapelle in particular, as this royal sanctuary, not just any church, but a royal sanctuary, um, offended the revolutionaries so much as this encapsulate embodiment of the, of the church and the monarchy in one building. So as with everything that we've been mentioning, the royal emblems were smashed sculptures were smashed stained glass within saint chapelle was smashed the grand reliquary was melted down and again as bearing the fate of originally silver and gold that wasn't conducive to proper worship but now is featuring any religious symbol or monument yeah. and saint chapelle is then converted into a granary effectively and you would think that Saint-Chapelle was one of the worst examples of uh, French revolutionary desacralization. Um, but of course, this continues with the, also by the destruction of the spire as well. You can see on the image on the left, which is the, the ruined version of Saint-Chapelle, which languished like this um, for 50 years before the sincere efforts to renovate Saint-Chapelle during the see... year. Oh, sorry. sorry yeah. No, 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 continue, please. Well, you can see on the image in the left as well, you see that basically the lower third. Um, so after it was a granary, it was, I believe, used as a um, as an archive for the um, for the what did it mean? Uh, Ministry of Justice, I'm sure it was the Palace of Justice, they called it, um, which was which was next door, uh, and so they removed the bottom third of the stained glass to 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 uh, to admit more light, um, you know, um, for that purpose. So yeah, uh, uh, about two thirds of the stained glass in Saint Chapelle survived. The medieval stained glass survived, but a lot of it was was lost. I mean, early on. Uh, some of it was broken, 
uh, some of it was carried away and which now exists in other other places um, bit, in you know bits and pieces panels and such but yeah so that's what you can see on that image on the on the left the um the um the lower you know the, the basically the lower third of all of the windows um removed for, for, for light if you think the example of San Chapelle is awful well you could say the most um <laughs> horrific sort of um, act of desecration is left for the Royal Mausoleum at, Sa at the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Oh. Originally, in, originally in July, there had already been a sack of Saint-Denis um, to acquire, again, all the monuments or the, uh, anything that could be used to be melted down. But on August the 10th, there was an actual official, actually on August the 1st, sorry, there was an official decree by the National Convention that the tombs and the mausoleums of the former kings mounted in the Church of Saint-Denis in the temples and other places across the Republic will be destroyed. So there was a specific government mandate. This wasn't just a spontaneous act of um, vandalism to desecrate the royal tombs. So the monuments to the Merovingian and Carolingian kings from Clovis to Charlemagne and you know later kings such as uh, uh, Charles the Bull, Charles the Mad uh, were smashed and this was followed by another wave of great desecrations in October where laborers had effectively um, gotten into the vaults, the Bourbon vaults and they began opening all of the coffins of the de Valois and uh, Bourbon monarchs, um, such as the body of Henry IV, his wife, uh, Marie de Medici, and of course the, uh, the horrifically uh, decomposed body of uh, Louis XIII. It's quite interesting, again, that uh, all of these bodies, regardless of how old you know, the corpses were, such as Henry IV's corpse, which had been there for 170 years, uh, was relatively well preserved compared to the, uh, the extent of the putrefaction of uh, Louis XV. I think looking at this from a Catholic point of view and my vilification of Louis XV and how Catholics held him as, as the Antichrist, it would be rather appropriate that of all the monarchs, um, it was his body in particular that was the most um, uh, decomposed, the most corrupted. Um, but what this essentially meant is that the royal bodies were being turned out of their coffins. I actually have, that's actually the, thumbnail for today and aspects of their bodies such as you know the hair that had survived or you know even even the royal jaws say for example were taken and they effectively became memorabilia as well the very corpses of the kings yes and and, and of course some of them were were um profane um horrific ways thrown in thrown into piles uh, burnt or uh, other other things depending on depending on which and where, what period they uh, what which of these um, um which of these exhumations to give it a flight name uh, but um, yes and of course I, I you know again think of things like the Spanish um Civil War and uh, things that have happened to the corpses of uh, priests, nuns, and such uh, in that time. So, I think what is sort of more horrifying is listening to or reading eyewitness accounts and how, rather than perceiving this as you know, essentially an order directed by the government, there was a spontaneous sort of outbreak of jubilation at the desecration of these various tombs how the population sort of willingly went along with this it wasn't simply a, a government fiat and there was such um uh, uh, the, the facilitation of the desecration of the various bodies i mean uh, you know everyone was spared this also no one was spared this also included uh the body of louis the 14th as well uh the most uh the grandiose of all of the uh, King of France up to that point. Yeah. Um, 
and of course uh, what later happens now that all the churches of france had been you know sacked uh, they had been nationalized um the non-juring priests were essentially hunted down and executed and churches throughout france were closed it wasn't enough for the government to own the churches now by october of 1793 um churches were now no longer allowed to offer masses anymore. Um, what to do with all these empty spaces? Well, of course, the uh, the argument that came from the materialists and the atheists uh, was to turn them into uh, temples of reason, to yeah. bring back these neoclassical uh, pagan motifs um, in the Rousseauian sort of pursuit of nature and primordialism and this was championed by among others because again i mentioned that robespierre was not a atheist he advocated his own cult in opposition to the more radical republicans i mean it should be i mean my argument essentially is that a uh, robespierre was similar to stalin and that he positioned himself as a centrist in the context of the french revolution <laughs> <laughs> No, to his uh, to his right, you have the Dantonists, who are essentially accepting of some form of limited Catholic worship, and then to his left, you have the uh, Hebatists and uh, Fouché, who actually later goes on and becomes the Minister of Police under Napoleon. And there are various ideologues, such as uh, uh, Momoho, who try and create a humanist religion out of this uh, atheistic drive to create this uh, cult of reason. And this was perceived essentially to be a new democratic uh, civic belief system, a religion of man. And now that Notre Dame has had the images of the kings or rather these Gothic effigies removed and people are liberally uh, pissing and defecating on the statues in the streets, um, the carcass of Notre Dame was transformed into the greatest of these temples of reason, um, which was supposedly to become a uh, annual uh, celebration, the main festival to be held um, in the revolutionary calendar in Paris, um, instead of an altar to Christ, as we saw with the altar that was uh, consecrated on the ashes of the Bastille, there is now an altar to liberty um, and the pursuit of which wasn't to embark upon a spiritual journey, but it was to salute philosophy. We have pagan Roman imagery um, and the personification of the goddess of liberty. Um, you can almost say that there was an attempt to create some sort of revolutionary transubstantiation in all of this. Um, <laughs> wow. But and, the... and also, uh, of course, later on... <laughs> The most enormous uh, statue to the goddess of liberty of all, uh, strangely enough, was was sent to uh, sent to America. Yes, indeed, that's uh, that's slightly later, but uh, you yeah. can say following in the uh, the if, similar if, pattern. In the, in the same pattern. All the, also, I wanted I, I, people asked in the chat. Uh, no, Charlemagne is buried in Archen. Uh, Archen, um, not uh, he's not in Saint Denis, so his support was not included. I think there were maybe four kings who were not uh, in Saint Denis. Um, I don't know precisely because, of course, Saint Denis was was constructed under the um, the auspices of uh, Abbe Suger um, in the twelfth, the very early twelfth century. Um, to put this in context, Hugh Capet uh, became king of France at the end of the tenth century. Um, and the Capetians obviously were the, the line which had produced all of the kings of France, with the exception of the Bonapartes since then. And before then, you have the Carolingians, uh, the Robertians, which were essentially predecessors of the Capetians, and of course, the Merovingians before that. But as Mr. D has pointed out, um, the Carolingian Empire also included Italy, northern Italy, and it included Germany and the Low Countries as well. There was simply West Francia, Middle Francia, and East Francia. And Aachen was conceived to be a new imperial center within all of that. Um, so Paris only became the recognized 
capital of a country when you have the break off of West Francia from what would later become the Holy Roman Empire and the Capetian dynasty uh, ruling over that, albeit from different branches, but they're all essentially descended from Hugh Capet in one way or another. The only, again, now that we have these festivals consecrated to the cult of reason, Robespierre pushes back against this and rededicates these after the fall of the Hebatists. And following that, we have the execution of Danton. Um, Robespierre goes along with the veneration of the classical Roman Republican virtues and um, veneration of uh, fides, uh, justitia, uh, temperantia, etc., and associating various gods' heads with these virtues. And he brings together all the factionalism of the French Revolution to try and create the cult of the supreme being. Uh, just in terms of that, uh, people often mention the cult of the supreme being as being the summit of Robespierre's insanity. And I don't consider that at all, really. I, I consider the cult of supreme being to be this ho horrific fusion of all of the elements of, you know, the religious sort of anti-Catholic um, cultism, which had come before then. Uh, it's almost like a, a, a form of Republican syncreticism, if that makes sense. Um, he was trying to appeal to everyone. But in the process, as you can appreciate, Dee, when you try to appeal to everyone, you end up appealing to no one. And especially when you have created a cult, it's not enough to create a cult, but you also place yourself ahead of that cult, like a revolutionary pope, like an Innocent III, combining both you know, secular and religious authority as a Roman emperor and Pontifex Maximus as bridge builder. You can say that in some ways Robespierre was the revolutionary bridge builder in this case, but of course, as the high priest, he was the most visible target and was uh, killed only a month after this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Not he's not prepared again. Not prepared for. Not prepared to, to for what he had unleashed, and, and certainly was not able to uh, manage to manage it uh, as he should have, I suppose, by his own logic. So this is just an image of one of the sacks of um, Saint Denis, but in terms of sort of rounding off this discussion, we we began it by focusing on the parallels. And you can say the uh, the preamble to the revolutionary phase of iconoclasm and the French wars of religion and how you can say that there is some sort of depressed Calvinism here, which is unleashed in a different spirit and a atheistic and an anti-Christian spirit, even if it may be theistic or pagan, um, which emerges during the course of the reign of terror. But of course, with the death of Robespierre and the quote unquote Thermidorian reaction, um, the worst aspects of the revolution were put on hold until you have Napoleon and the, uh, the, the reconciliation, partial reconciliation with the Catholic Church, albeit he treats Pope Innocent absolutely appallingly, and the signing of the Concordat, which will be essentially the basis of religion in France up until Emile Combes' separation of church and state in 1905. But we should also mention that there is, of course, the war in the Vendée. Um, but in terms of being directed against symbols or iconoclasm, again, this is very much a war waged against the people. But it should be noted that uh, Paris is not France, albeit the most obvious targets of iconoclasm do occur in Paris for various obvious reasons. And compare the the, the overall sort of Catholic swelling of support during the wars of religion, as opposed to Paris being becoming essentially the uh, the center of this new anti-Catholic cult, uh, which consumes the capital from the seventeen throughout the seventeen nineties. But of course, with Napoleon and the defeat of Napoleon, there is an attempt to partially restore uh, what had been lost during the course of the French Revolution. During the reign of Louis XVIII, of course, the royal bodies, which had been exhumed and then desecrated with the sack on Saint-Denis or the targeted strike on Saint-Denis by the National Convention. Um, 
Saint-Denis is partially restored. But as you can see with these various monuments here, it's these buildings are left languishing in this ruined state for, for decades, decades long after the, um, the French Revolution. Napoleon makes an attempt to restore some buildings, like a partial restoration of Saint-Chapelle. But as I've explained with the temple, uh, he is also responsible for a continuation of aspects of this iconoclasm. And indeed, um, he ends up imprisoning the Pope as his military situation begins to deteriorate in the um, 1810s. But by 1840, long after the revolution has passed, and surprisingly enough under Louis-Philippe, we see the beginning of sincere restorationist efforts that will continue and accelerate under the reign of Napoleon III during the Second French Empire. So, Mr. D, would you like to talk us through um, the restoration <laughs> efforts of uh, uh, Violet le Duc? Yeah, I, I can s s sort of go over the major outline of that. Um, I mean, Violet Le Duc was born in, um, I believe, 1814. So, um, so again, you you have to, as A.M. said, you have to think about many of these monuments. You know, had been severely damaged or had been quote, repurposed and had had basically languished for you know many many decades, which. Uh, uh, but there was a there was a, quite an early I mean the committee of monuments um, like you know quite an early sort of um, at least nominal eye towards the preservation you know of these uh, of the, of these of these works of quality divorced from their original purpose and there was sort of precedent I mean there was a figure so there's there's a man called Prosper Mary May or Mary May but, um, who had done a lot of work basically documenting fragments uh and and he he published an encyclopedia which is uh, which is fairly well known um which was basically you, you know his drawings and and his uh, sort of sort of writing about this and so there was this nascent kind of movement in the, in the beginning of the 19th century and and you 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 have to think also that prior to that you know you know i think there was a shift away from there was a shift towards uh, this idea of reviving um the ancient spirit and you find it in you know uh, palladianism and, and neoclassicism but the, in the 19th century you also start to get people who are interested in uh the gothic uh so-called histories you know the gothic architectures um and even you know you, you start to get you know revival or, or egyptology you know, rivaling in, in interest in the monuments of Egypt as well, and so uh, as the night and and of course that that those styles were uh, associated with you know Napoleon the first and such. Um, so this this sort of spirit of revivalism, uh, I think, um, became stronger and stronger as the nineteenth century went on. Uh, and so um, enter uh, Eugene Violette Le Duc, um, who um, who who train who's who was an author and 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 he had, he had begun his sort of early training um uh, as an architect uh and he came to the attention of of Prosper Marimé and uh, and other people quite quite early I'm trying to remember actually how his uh, how how the their paths crossed um yeah so uh Hang on a moment. I have a no I have a note there. Yeah. So so actually he 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 was he was um in his twenties and he'd actually not gotten a degree degree in architecture. I mean he he'd studied it and he'd been in, interested and uh, he had um uh, made it he'd made a, 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 a travels around France and made um beautiful sketches and you can again look up his um his cataloging of various um. Uh, cathedrals medieval architecture and such and um and so of course he he had he had amassed basically a, an autodidactic um um you know kind of catalog and mastery of uh you know of um, mostly the french gothic the french medieval styles and so he'd come to the attention 
of, of Mary May and others. Um, and he was given his first project, which was um, the restoration of uh, uh, Vézelay Abbey, which is um, in, in eastern France. Um, and this is a building which had actually been, it had been re seriously damaged uh, in the um, prior to the French Revolution, but also in the French Revolution. It was really on the verge of collapse. Uh, and so this, they, they'd sort of taken a great leap of faith in Violet Le Duc and given him this project, which was to um, both stabilize and to restore uh, as much as he could this, this abbey, which he did admirably. Um, you have to remember these projects took a very long time. I believe that project took 20 years. So even though it was his first project, it was that restoration was still going on well into his kind of mid mid to late late career um but basically on the strength of his success with with that uh project he went on to do you know more and more important things culminating of course in his i, I would say his 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 greatest achievement which was the restoration of notre dame de paris uh you you have anything to pop in that i you know in my woeful uh so well, no. In terms of just, life. in terms of just, well, uh, not in terms of his early life, but just I think in terms of the state of churches, the tiles on churches throughout France were confiscated during the French Revolution. As a consequence of that, many churches had no roofs; they were just open to the elements. Yeah, open so, to the elements. Um, and this was not just the case with uh, uh, Versailles; it was obviously the case with Notre Dame as well. Um, just a an honourable mention here, which is the fate of Chartres Cathedral. Uh, Chartres, of course, was one of the first, you can say it really kick-started the 12th century Renaissance in Gothic architecture in France. And Chartres, as a symbolic target, as a site of pilgrimage, um, it wasn't enough to remove all the tiles, to empty out all the valuables within the church and to impress revolutionary seals everywhere. But the local committee had actually decided to demolish Chartres Cathedral. And the only reason Chartres Cathedral, say for example, didn't suffer uh, the same fate as St. Saviour's in Moscow, which was blown up and was supposed to essentially like uh, uh, the Place de la Bastille, it was supposed to serve as um, a foundation for Stalin's uh, monolithic palace of the people. That never happened. But the only reason a chart was saved is because an architect suggested that the cost of moving the rubble would be prohibitively expensive. And for that reason, Chart survived and wasn't demolished like the Bastille. So it was, you could say, very touch and go for all of these churches. And for some reason, 1840 isn't just a, an important year in French history. I mean, is this year, it's around this year that we have the um, return of Napoleon uh, and his uh, internment in uh, uh, Les Invalides. Um, this is also the same time uh, that we see the completion of Cologne Cathedral um, in in Prussia at that time under the auspices of uh, Frederick Wilhelm IV. Um, so, and also this is the time where we have the completion of uh, the Arc de Triomphe. So, I really do consider uh, Villers le Duc as you can say a leading light in terms of this romantic air of restorationism and you could say a revival of the gothic and not just the restoration of churches either of, of which um his restoration of notre dame as you say is probably his greatest achievement but also the you know, of course the reconsecration of the spire as well um but we also see his restoration of mont saint michel uh his restoration of a uh, 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 Carcassonne. Um, so it's not just, you know, the great sort of uh, slum clearing and sewer building of uh, Haussmann and the great reforms to construct the boulevards um, throughout the reign of Napoleon III, but this is also in concert with these ne this neo-Gothic revivalism, which of course will be imitated in Britain. At the same time that Notre Dame is being refurbished, we also see the construction of the Houses of Parliament. So 
all of these things sort of build on each other. And I think this is a European movement more than just a French movement. But you can say rather tragically, you know, France is finally recovering after the devastation of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Even though you have very temperamental regimes, which at best will last only 20 years, the restoration government only lasts 15 years from 1815 to 1830, if, even mm -hmm. if you count the fact that Louis XVIII was chased out. Louis Philippe and the Orleanist monarchy only lasts 18. Uh, Napoleon III will only last from 1848 until 1870. In spite of all of this, um, architecturally, in terms of the symbols of or some sort of uh, reconciliation between the pre-revolution and the post-revolution, um, Paris and France seem to be doing pretty well. And then, amidst all of this, you are struck with the Paris Commune and the Franco-Prussian War. And what is fascinating about the Paris Commune is, in addition to it being essentially celebrated by Marx as a prototype for communism or what we later see in France, which is the separation of church and state, uh, the quote-unquote emancipation of women, and the radicalization of, of um, military actors such as the, uh, the National Guard. We also see the revival of de-Christianization at the heights of the revolution, the transition of monasteries into new revolutionary clubs, the destruction of symbolic targets, such as the Vendôme column, which was there to celebrate the victories of Napoleon. And by extension, it was a symbol of the second French empire restored under Napoleon III. However, as the military situation of the commune worsened, the fact that there wasn't going to be some spontaneous explosion of the communard phenomena throughout all of France, that this was very much quarantined in Paris. And as peace was finally made with the Prussians and at the Treaty of Frankfurt in May of 1871. May effectively is the final month for the Paris Commune. And rather than give up and surrender peacefully uh, to the new government under um, uh, Adolf Thiers and the Third Republic, the communards basically execute a scorched earth policy in Paris. And bear in mind that this is after the Haussmann reforms. This is after the clearing of the slums. This is after the construction of the boulevards. And this is after the attempts at restoration and beautifying parts of Paris. They decide uh, the communards in an act of sort of last act of spite and vindictiveness to burn places like the Trulli Palace. You can see prominently displayed on the left here and uh, the Hôtel de Ville, which had been the main administrative center of Paris, which is also the site of the last stand of Robespierre before he was guillotined. And what I find sort of tragic about this is that you know, the Tuileries Palace, the Republic was inaugurated, the First Republic was inaugurated with the storming of the Tuileries Palace in August of, um, or sorry, September of 1792. After the devastation caused by the uh, scorched earth tactics of the communards, which left the Tuileries Palace as a, a, essentially laying in rubble, as you can see here on the right, um, it remained like that for 13 years. In 1883, I actually mentioned this on a previous lecture regarding the Gomme de Chambord, Henry V, whereby his death effectively allowed for the new French Republic to become consolidated after a period of monarchist revivalism. And in, seven, in 1873, a, a, a serious time where the French monarchy could have been restored had it not been for the desire of Henry V to restore the monarchy as was, as a legitimist conception of monarchy, with him being a monarch in the pre-revolutionary mold as opposed to the mold of uh, Louis Philippe. Coinciding with the death of Henry V, the Comte de Chambord, which ended really the legitimist claim on the French throne, the new emboldened revolutionary government of uh, uh, Jules Grévy and uh, Leon Gambetta authorized the destruction of the Tuileries Palace in 1883, not the restoration of it, but the destruction. Mm -hmm. And you can almost mm -hmm. say that with the storming of the original Tuileries Palace, 
you can say that the Third Republic is inaugurated with the final destruction of the Tuileries Palace as one of these symbols of monarchy. So the iconoclastic tendency of French republicanism has never left that specific period of the 1790s. And you can say that this is then reconfirmed with the celebration of Bastille Day, which becomes prominent in the time of the early French Third Republic, the readoption of Les Marseilles as the anthem of France, and indeed the continuous the continuous sort of spontaneous outbursts of uh, of insurrection in Parisian streets has become a common feature of French politics. I appreciate that I've given a um, a rather sort of overarching summary here, uh, but Dee, is there anything you want to comment, even bringing us back to uh, uh, Violet Le Duc regarding, um, I can say, the ultimate tragedy of the iconoclasm that it never really leaves France? Well, yes, I mean, certainly, so just, just to touch on Violet Le Duc once more, I just wanted to kind of go over because, because I mean, he was really involved in some of the most important, I mean, his basically the next project after um, Thessaly was um, was Saint-Chapelle. You know, he was he was the one responsible for that. Um, and of course, Notre Dame in Paris, he did uh, Saint-Denis. He was responsible for the um, for the uh, the restoration of uh, restoration of that as well. Um, uh, and other other churches uh, in, in in Switzerland as well, where he where he moved at the near the end of his life. Um, and as you mentioned, Carcassonne, um, he uh, the, the medieval fortifications. He basically did a, a huge re rebuilding job there. Uh, another famous thing that he did was um, a, um, uh, a Chateau de Pierrefonds, which. Uh, was at the behest of Napoleon the Third. He said that he, you know, he commissioned um, Violet Le Duc, who was, you know, obviously quite famous and powerful, powerful at this time, to uh, to build him a kind of um, medieval palace uh, on the site of, of course, a ruin, uh, which Pierrefon was. I mean, they they actually he actually left the ruin as a sort of pic picturesque, sort of romantic feature, and he. You know, he constructed and um, reconstructed a sort of fantasy of medievalism, uh, or sort of uh, revival uh, Gothic or revival med French medievalism uh, there, and you, you can still see it today here at all. Um, uh, the project I think outlasted uh, Napoleon the Third, but um, you know, but of course it brings up the, another question, which is plagued you know, art and architecture since, which is the idea of, you know, what are, what are the kind of, uh, what is the moral foundation of restoration and, and what form should that take? You know, obviously I would call Violet Le Duc a romantic as so many of these figures were. And so the restoration was perhaps not, even though he had extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary facility and understanding and, and, and learning, um, about um, all the modes of Gothic architecture in in in, in France, you know, he had done extensive personal research, and, and certainly was was um, with um, Prosper Mary May, um, the leading authority on it. But you know, his restoration was also a kind of um, it, it's a sort that that might be frowned upon today, you know, because again, it was also a kind of personal expression. There were, it was not just, you know, let's figure out what was there and do the, do a sort of, you know, half restoration based on, you know, everything that we know. We can't add anything of our own. We can't add any artist mm. or architect expression, which he did. You know, there's very much of him in, in all of those projects, including N Notre Dame. Um, of course, the spire that people saw tragically burn and collapse um, in 2018 was his 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 invention that is not the medieval spire it's it's um it's based upon um images of the medieval spire which but by that by by his time had had been scrapped but uh, that entire thing was was of his design and and he did a lot of changes to notre dame for instance the famous gargoyles you know that people associated with notre dame were all his um innovation some of them had been removed and they were they were properly from 
you know, their historical time. But many of them were, again, were, were creations by artists of the you know, like Duke's time. So, you know, again, I, I, I am quite fond of this in a way, because, of course, it was it wasn't just this sort of clinical, you know, let's just rebuild, you know, what we have. But also, it, you know, it was it was a contribution. You know, it was an artistic contribution of of his own. In fact, I believe that, of course, there were also people remember there were there were copper statues saints that had been removed literally days before the fire in 2018 um, and so they were all spared and one of them i believe it was the statue of saint matthew was uh, a port basically a portrait of via let the duke he cast himself his his own face as <laughs> uh, saint matthew so yeah i mean it, but it's, it is a very interesting question that of course that, that of course comes up all the time with this idea of restoration not only in architecture but in painting and sculpture and everything else every every other kind of art as well you know uh to what degree you know do, does the present assert itself on the past and and is the act of restoration indeed entirely an expression of the present you know altogether is a restoration real you know uh and obviously, these I I think these these questions sort of moot if you look into how such things were dealt with in the past. It was always this sense of incorporating, um, in a way, a kind of uh, kind of your own aesthetic and intellect on, onto a project. But of course, that with Violet Ledoux, people like that, you had people, who, men who were extraordinarily learned and quite sensitive to what is proper, you know, what is what will fit with it. You didn't have people like, let's put a swimming pool, you know, on top of Notre Dame. Literally, I'm not joking. That was one of the proposals and put uh, uh, stain, make a stained glass ceiling with LED um, light show um, to, to do a steel and glass. Um, you know, and, I mean, you didn't have this sort of thing, you know, had men who, again, were asserting their own aesthetic sense, but doing it in a, in a very sympathetic way. So uh, anyway, very in in interesting figure. And, um, you know, and, and, and as I said, almost entirely an autodidact uh, you know he he um as i said he he uh there was push for him to go to the old de beaux art and uh but he ended up not going you know he said you just end up doing work like an architect uh you know like all the other architect architects there um and uh so it, it's quite quite extraordinary quite an extraordinary moment and and of course entirely influential um uh, in with future uh restoration and future kind of care for um you know for the monuments of, of the past uh and he also men mentioned earlier the statue of liberty i mean he was um he also was a consultant on that project and he is the one that decided on using a copper skin and he is the one that did the engineering uh necessary for the working of that copper skin choosing to do it in copper repoussé the thickness of the material and all of that uh, he also uh oddly enough built a, a massive statue of uh Vercingetorix, uh, which is still <laughs> standing, um, which is a, again a, a copper-clad, uh, copper-clad monument, much like the statue. Of it. So, um, yes. And on the the subject of, of course, the com the commune, um, which again, I, I I hesitate to add, but you certainly can find a lot of parallels that still exist today all over the world with, uh, but with. Uh, repugnant thing to happen with the commune. Sadly, of course, I I consider France, the 19th century French, to be, you know, you know the, I think painting in the 19th century was really became, France became the epicenter of so many movements, you know, so many sort of influential schools of painting from the very beginning of the 19th century to the end. Uh, but sadly, I think a lot of artists in the middle, late 19th century, uh, as artists are today, began to become almost entirely associated with these revolutionary uh, ideas and factions. And uh, we were chatting slightly before the stream, you know, and I, I was dismayed to discover that Edouard Manet, uh, you know, um, an art artist I quite admire, um, was also uh, associated with, uh, with with the Paris Commune, although by uh, um, by um, once removed, you know, he was his his name was added to the list of the artists in support of the communards, but he himself had escaped from France several uh, escaped from Paris several days before um, all of it kicked off. So uh, 
Uh, but but again, you you get Gustav Corbe and, and and other other great artists of the period who, you know, really began this kind of um, tradition, so called that remains of uh, of of artists and association with you know revolutionary uh, types and, and iconoclasts indeed. Uh, and it's a very uneasy, it's a very uneasy uh, relationship, but um, uh, but certainly it's unavoidable with with many art period and you can sort of keep and dig into the, into that those political uh, connections it's quite quite interesting in some cases just um and thank you for that d uh, i just want to sort of add something regarding a uh, uh Viollet duke regarding the innovations as an artist but also the sympathetic attempts at restoration really to me that sort of personifies him as the great architect of the second empire because I, I look at someone like Napoleon III and I, on the one hand, see someone who is, I hate to use the term, I, I, I dismayed using it when I was talking about him, but the idea of modern conservatism, the idea that he's simultaneously trying to build a populist coalition by appealing below the middle classes to the agrarian population as some form of one nationism, whatever that means. Mm. Yet at the same time, he is styling himself as a monarch in the pre-French Revolutionary mold while appealing to the Bonapartist legacy on the other. He is trying to reconcile aspects of the pre-revolution, yet he is also, essentially his legitimacy is predicated on the revolution. So in many ways, you can say the, uh, the multifaceted nature of the government of the Second Empire, which essentially is pre-revolutionary in some cases, with a twist. And I see that in the restorationism of uh, Violet Le Duc. And of course, the idea that any sort of enduring right in France, again, I use that word advisedly, bearing in mind what we said earlier, um, was associated with the reconciliation of aspects of the pre revolution, in particular, the veneration of the Catholic Church and wedding the stability of the government with the Catholic Church. It was, again, something which was decried by Quinette in the passage I brought up at the beginning, the association with the state and the church. And, of course, that is something the French Revolution tried to destroy, and they did so by creating a new religion out of humanism, essentially secularism, and then the aborted attempt at the cult of the supreme being that never really went anywhere and has no real legacy. However, secularism did revive itself during the Third Republic. And ultimately, if we see the left in France as associated with secularism and as associated with the nationalization of church property, that obviously happens again in the course of the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, the left in France being associated with the attempts, as with the Bastille, to denigrate any history before 1789 as feudal, as monarchist, and as tyrannical. And so in that way, all of these aspects of the iconoclastic spirit play out repeatedly in French history, first with the wars of religion, and then, of course, the increasingly sort of uh, monarchomach um, uh, uh, polemicists which are coming out attacking the idea of monarchy and trying to assert Calvinist sort of political supremacy. You see that with the revolution, you see that with the communards, and you see that triumphant in the Third Republic. So I hope this discussion tonight has just brought to the fore, you know, the nature of iconoclasm in France, how it took shape. And you can say the various attempts of reconciling that and trying to undo that in the case of the, 80, the 1570s, 1580s, the response was absolutism in France regarding the madness of the terror from 1793 to 1794. The response was a weakened vanilla republic in the form of directory. And then it was an attempt to reconcile the Catholic Church to some extent onto Napoleon. Then, of course, that reconciliation continues with the unstable regimes of 19th century France. And like I said, it's part of a romantic pan-European movement. And 
France, in addition to being at the center of the restoration effort, as Dee mentioned, was at the center of uh, artistic life. And again, it should be mentioned musical life. I mean, people are far more aware of sort of 19th century German composers, but in all sort of aspects of the art, from architecture to fine arts, to music, to opera, Paris was a leading light. And of course, this is sort of undone dramatically and tragically uh, with the uprising of the commune, which is one of the most uh, tragic instances, you could say, of the entire 19th century history. You can argue that of all the revolutions in the 19th century, the 1830 revolution and the 1848 revolution, that nothing scarred France quite as badly as the 1870 revolution and the legacy of the commune. Um, so I think that rounds off the discussion quite nicely. I'll, I'll get onto the super chats, but Dee, is there anything else you would like to say? Um, no, I, I wanted to recommend um, if people are interested in um, reading about uh, specifically iconoclasm in the uh, after the during and after the French Revolution. I it's been many years uh, since I read in translation that there are two books. Uh, there are others, but I think the um, there are two quite famous ones. One is called uh, Le Vandalisme Jacobin by um, Gustave Gautereau. And there's another one by Francois Souchal called Le Vandalisme de la Révolution. Um, and that, that I know, certainly know there's a translation of the first. But um, it, yeah, that, there's, not, there's not as much written uh, until uh, fairly recently about, about specifically um, art and architecture in relation to uh, Revolution in France, but people may want to uh, want to want to look at uh, look at those. Uh, but yes, and and again, I think it's it's important that people re just re think of how all of this ex still echoes in our contemporary world. I think French this, this entire period, uh, beginning with oh, I always thought beginning with the Revolution, but I just thought you make a compelling case beginning earlier with the War of Religion. But uh, it's it's amazing how it all. We've never escaped this um, hall of mirrors, and it's not a nice hall of mirrors like Versailles. So, uh, yeah. No, no. Thank you very much for that, D. Okay, so on to the super chats. Uh, Judge Caligula Bushman for uh, six euros. Can't make it tonight. I'm very interested in this topic, although my focus on the unfortunate destruction of Catholic places in the Low Countries. Well, I do mention that in a dedicated lecture and discussion, actually, on um, the Dutch revolt or the uh, the schism within the Netherlands, which, of course, used to include um, what is now Belgium, parts of northern France and Flanders and Artois, and, of course, Luxembourg. But my original contention has always been that Calvinism was an extension of the French Reformation, but the French Reformation succeeded outside of France and failed inside of France. And so we see it manifested in this strange and anti-Christian way, an ultimately secularist way, as a result of the legacy of the French Revolution. Um, uh, Josefina Herivega has sent four $2 super chats in succession, thank you, and then a $20 super chat. Uh, please pause a moment and help me with the technical aspects of buying a question and fitting it into a super chat. Um, sorry, that was this must have been earlier in the stream. Um, obviously, I, I waited until the end to read the super chats, but I can see you've asked questions subsequently, so you've managed to work it out. Yeah, I think, so, I think people help people help the, in the chat. So, Josephina, again, um, do you use Discord to talk um, and put this into further detail? Uh, where can I ask questions? Well, uh, I'm not always available. I do pop into the Discord occasionally, but uh, there are plenty of other people. If you um, go into the various uh, Discord channels and ask a question, um, I'm, I'm sure there are at least sort of 50 Spurgs out there <laughs> uh, who can uh, who can tackle your question. Um, whether I'm going to be one of those Spurgs or not, um, uh, it's possible. <laughs> Uh, Lady of Shalott for five Australian dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, the worst massacres occurred in the Vendee, where the people fought to protect churches and priests. Radical liberation had a great stream. Yes, he has a specific series of streams on uh, 
left-wing radicalism, but I really think I'm, I mean, I'm more interested in the the Catholic and the royal armies and the Shohamui and uh, you can say the ideology of royalism after the execution of the king um, and how you can say this manifested or indeed was mitigated or betrayed by Louis XVIII during the restoration that restored nothing. Um, so I'm interested in doing the Vendée, but uh, again, this is a far more Paris-centric stream. And I think the Vendée at some point really deserves its own stream. In fact, I think it was one of the first things I ever planned, but never got round to it, unfortunately. Um, Darf Kilhoun for $2. Uh, good stream while I run a five miles with my dog. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the stream serves some sort of distracting function. Uh, Josephina again. Uh, what was the name of the committee who decided what works of art should be destroyed? I'd like to read about that. That was the Committee of Alienation of National Goods. Uh, the Rabbit Hole for $5. Thank you for your great work. Atlantis was real, but I can't argue that in a little super chat, but buy a drink on me is what I would have wanted. Um, I'm not sure how Atlantis really fits into the grand scheme of this stream. Uh, D, do you think of a way of reconciling Atlantis uh, with this stream? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Uh, yeah, maybe. Well, we're all Hyperboreans. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, I'm willing. To, I'm willing to entertain such things. Uh, the Enri for uh, ten pounds just says a uh, wonderful stream am and mr d well uh thank you very much uh the on it's uh very much appreciated thank you uh clear them out for uh 20 krona thank you very much um sorry national goods um lady of shallot um not natural goods if i accidentally said that um you know the bien national as uh, the euphemism which had been uh, given to the ecclesiastical property in France, I believe, by uh, one Maurice de Talleyrand, also known as the Abbot Talleyrand, lest you forget. Um, and a final super chat from Josephina for, again, just uh, $2. So uh, thank you very much. All right. D, is there um, anything you would like to say or you would like to shill before we leave tonight? I would just like to reiterate my thanks for uh, in inviting me on. I'm I'm always uh, always thrilled to talk to you, AM, and and very again very happy to uh, to see you back, producing uh, your wonderful content. Um, as far as a shill, uh, you know, uh, I, I I can be found uh, as an irritant on on popular opinion, so people are welcome to tune into that on Academic Agents Channel. I've got a Twitter where I'm also an irritant. So if people, uh, if people like uh, self abuse, they can join Twitter and uh, and follow me there. Uh, but otherwise, no. In the game, thanks. Uh, just thank you again, D, so much for uh, for coming on. I I always enjoy these uh, uh these streams, which aren't just so chained to the chronology of events as I'm uh, as I'm usually doing. Um, I, I do like a more sort of uh wider all-encompassing conversation and on that note because this has ended up being a mini series of streams i just want to put it out there i'm not sure when this will happen but i'm interested in doing two follow-up streams to this one is on the scouring of russia which will talk about the uh material devastation of the uh russian revolution and enduring devastation of the Russian Revolution into the Stalinist era and the communist era in general. Um, I'm thinking of a good sort of place to start that, maybe the uh, the burning of Moscow or talking about, you know, Russian, uh, Russian revivalism or something like that. I'm not quite sure how to fit it in. And then uh, the final stream in this, I'm, I was thinking, might actually be the scouring of Germany, which would focus on the devastation of the bombing campaigns during World War II and what was lost as a result of those. Um, of course, Dee, if you're interested in either of those topics, I'd be more than happy to have you back. 
Uh, possibly. So, I, 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 uh, Russia is not my forte, but certainly um, aspects of uh, the story of what what happened to Germany are things that I can talk about. So, yeah. So again, thank you, everyone so much for uh tuning in and uh d is far from an irritant on unpopular opinions uh he's absolutely wonderful to listen to thank you all and good night